Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is February yes. 17th, 2021, <laughs> and I am super excited today to have in Mormon Stories Podcast Studios, Jenna Spangler. Hey, Jenna. Hi, John. Welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you. So I've had Jana on Mormon Stories a few times, uh, mm -hmm. often in panels to talk about topics du jour, but what we've never done is just have Jana in to kind of tell her story. And if I had to kind of describe why I was interested in Jana, it's not just that she's almost a neighbor. Um, <laughs> she is a lovely human. And one of the traditions of Mormon Stories podcast over the years is to interview people who uh, know all the problems with the church, who care about women and women's issues and um, minorities, uh, racial issues, LGBTQ issues, all the issues that kind of uh, vex or plague modern Mormonism, intellectual issues, et cetera. Um, but, and who, who find a way or who choose for whatever reason to stay engaged with the, with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as participatory, active, or semi-active members. Uh, for those who have been listening to Mormon Stories for quite some time, you'll remember my interviews with Dan Witherspoon and others. And that is the angle from which uh, I wanted to interview Jenna because she is in a semi-mixed faith marriage, I would say. She mm -hmm. is active in her Holiday Utah stake. Uh, whatever that means. Um, so that's kind of uh, uh, part of it is going to be her faith journey. Part of it is going to be um, how and where she's ended up with relation to the church. Part of it's going to be how she makes that work. And some of that is going to have to do with this, with the author and scholar, Richard Rohr, who we're going to be talking about. I became familiar with Richard Rohr, um, who is a sort of a Catholic wisdom guy who has written several books, including a book called Falling Upward, which is kind of not just for Catholics, but it's for religious people of all types to help them kind of think about uh, becoming wiser and potentially using uh, their religious tradition, whatever it is, to help uh, begin, let's just say, a second half of life um, of wisdom, sometimes even within a religious framework. And then finally, Jana is a life coach. She works with Symmetry Solutions with Natasha Elfer Parker. And she is someone who I refer others to for faith crisis stuff, for mixed faith marriages and the like. And so um, any wisdom that we can get from Jana along the way about not only how she navigates things, but also how she coaches others to navigate both faith crises uh, engagement with the church or disengagement and or mixed faith marriages or just marriages after faith crisis. Those are all the types of things that we're in store for today. So without any further ado, Jenna Spangler, <laughs> welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you so much, John. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Wasn't a long commute? It was not a long commute. <laughs> so it's a snowy day. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, where should we begin, Jana? Because we've had you on several times, but yeah. um, we've never had you tell your story. That so is true. How does your Mormon story begin? So my Mormon story, um, I guess, starts with my family of origin. I was born and raised in the church. Um, I come from uh, many lines of pioneers, Um and all the way back to Friends of Joseph Smith, I, I come down through Joseph Knight Sr. and uh, Cornelius Peter Lott and some other interesting people around um, Joseph Smith. I found out, listening to Year of Polygamy, actually, that my great-great-grandfather's half-sister was married to Joseph Smith. So didn't know that until I heard that podcast and learned a little bit about my family history. So... Mm. Um, so the church uh, has been really super important um, to just the formation of who I am and my family. Um, so I was the youngest of four children. Um, there was a big gap between me and my next sister. I was the youngest. 
So three children and then eight and a half years. And then I showed up and, um, you know, I had an interesting flavor of Mormonism growing up in my home. Like I always knew that it was absolutely the truth, the best way to live, the way to be happy. Um, no question about that in my home growing up. And my parents weren't terribly strict about doing all the things. I think uh, by the time I came along, they were, you know, they were busy with three older children and didn't feel like doing all the stuff, which is me. So I I remember growing up feeling like we weren't quite Mormon enough. I felt like we didn't read our scriptures um, at home as much as we should. And we didn't have family home evening and we weren't doing as many things as some of my friends did. We played with playing cards. That was a big thing. Back in my, Ooh, that's it, naughty. it was we were super Bruce naughty. McConkey would not approve. <laughs> Absolutely, but we, but we had you know Mormon doctrine firmly on the bookshelf, and um, so it it, it was. What it, town was it, this? This was here, just down the road from Holiday, here, Utah? Holiday, Utah. Okay. Yeah, grew up here, close to closer over to Cottonwood High School. So, yeah, so I I grew up, did seminary, did did all the things. Um, my family definitely had a um, kind of a perfectionist a perfectionist streak in it. My mother very much so, and I think that carried down to the way that I held a lot of things. Um, I, for sure, have a giant perfectionist streak that I've been trying to overcome for a while now, but that was laid down very early, um, and it affected the way that I did things with the church. I never really felt like I was doing it quite well enough. So like as a teenager or? Yeah, definitely as a teenager. Um, you know, my, my first real boyfriend uh, was from a family that was a really, really strong family. And, um, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of, uh, between this perfectionism and family dynamics, I grew up, um, with a lot of social issues. I grew up with a lot of, um, you know, growing up in, in elementary school and high school, I was always felt like I was always hustling for other people's approval, but I don't know that I got great social skills growing up. I didn't have a lot of friends in the neighborhood. I didn't have, and I don't think a lot of really good social skills were modeled or taught in my home either. So I struggled a bit. So when I, by the time I had my first boyfriend before I started, you know, I, was just kind of craving more structure than I actually had. And I was craving approval from other people. So I have this first boyfriend who's from this really, really religious family that I looked up to. I thought they were everything. And they were a family that did all the things and they did them well. And I just craved that. And it's interesting how that implanted in me in a really, um, I think, formative time of my life of how I wanted to be in the church when I grew up, when I had my a family of my own and um, really wanted to be one of those Mormons that did everything right and had all the spiritual experiences. I was always just really inquisitive, wanted to, wanted to learn all the things, but did seminary, graduated from seminary. Um, and then what years? So let's see, I graduated from high school in 1990. And um, went to Cottonwood High School right here. And then uh, right after high school, went to the University of Utah um, to get an accounting degree. And Re- Really quick, backing yeah. up just a tiny bit. So mm-hmm. what was your spiritual life like in, in high school? Was it doctrinal? Was it how was prayer mm-hmm. with Heavenly Father? Mm-hmm. How was seminary? Were you into the church spiritually and or doctrinally, or was it more of a cultural thing or some combination? So I think for me, I, it was, it was quite doctrinal. Um, I had a family who liked to have deeper discussions about things and really liked to understand things. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of self-study in the scriptures and things like that. Um, but I loved to have, I loved to have gospel discussions with people. Um, the spiritual end of it, I always felt like something was maybe missing for me, but I thought it was all me. 
I definitely took it all on myself. You know, I, I craved having some sort of a Moroni 10 4 experience. I craved you wanted that. I wanted it so badly. And because you didn't necessarily know the church was true, but you wanted to. It, it's like I knew, I never questioned it. I never questioned it, but I never had that kind of a spiritual experience. I think the spiritual experiences or whatever I was imagining a spiritual experience was never happened for me. But I was very, very, very convicted. And and part of that was, I think, who I surrounded myself with. And um I had I had several friends who were not necessarily LDS and and that actually is something that my family never had any qualms about, or, you know, I, there were no litmus tests for friendship with my family, with my, any of my siblings or my parents. It was never like, this big worry for me that you need to make sure that you have the right kind of friends or anything. I didn't have that, but I, I definitely gravitated in who I really, really admired were the very strong Orthodox Mormons and always kind of wanted that. And, so yeah, never really had that that big spiritual experience. I had my patriarchal blessing very young and it was long and detailed and had some crazy things in it that um, made like, me, like talking about my husband being like having huge callings in the church and, you know, reading, it's interesting, you know, I've been through a uh, spoiler alert. I've been through a faith transition and, and reading it prior to that faith transition and reading it after I I'm blown away at how heavily patriarchal my patriarchal blessing is. I'm like this, none of this is about me. It's all about what I'm going to do to support my husband. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty intense that is it way. exciting at the time though. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it has references to, to, building the temple in the center place of Zion in, in in connection with the great convocations prior to the coming of the Lord kind of stuff Holy or moly. administrations of the millennial kingdom under, under the direction of the savior. Who like is this guy, I mean, right. I had quite the patriarch, but as, <laughs> as a 13 year old, when I'm getting that patriarchal blessing and my family's reading it and they're like, Holy cow, you're going to marry a general authority and you're going to be like, no pressure. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> and so I always had that in the back of my mind, though. I think I, I think I can't underestimate the the effect that that had on me of saying that this is my potential. Like my potential is that I'm going to be in the administrations of the millennial kingdom. Like it is a lot of pressure as, as a help meet or, or as oh, that a... that word's in there. <laughs> that <laughs> word. Oh, really? yeah. oh, it I was is. Kidding. <laughs> it's absolutely in there. I, what the crap's a help help meet. I don't know what this is. I learned early what a help meet was. <laughs> yeah. So supporting an awesome husband, supporting your, this amazing your, person, your mission in life mm -hmm. was to support an amazing husband. Absolutely. And a <laughs> lot of it was in there and, and it was a lot of pressure of like, now you've got to be super faithful to make this happen. Okay. Right. Yeah. So as a teen in high school, yeah. were you straight A's? Were you goofing off? Were you, were you breaking the <laughs> rules? Were you Molly Mormon? So in high school, I was not breaking a whole lot of rules. Um, you know, I think I tried alcohol one time Whoa, as, a, as a sophomore. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I, I really wasn't supposed to do that. And I'm telling you, the guilt was thick. Okay. The guilt was really, really thick. Um, but for the most part, I was a really good kid, a really good student. Um, I, it, it's interesting. It kind of speaks to some of the um, perfectionism that was alive and well for me. Because, you know, I was taking a heavy load, lots of AP classes. My junior year, I was in the school play. I was working, had a job. Um, I've had a job ever since I was 14 years old. I've worked. And, what types of jobs? I uh, started out just working um, at a pool. I, I, I grew up in a condominium complex. And so I was hired by the condominium complex to take care of the pool. I wasn't really a lifeguard, but I got to just hang out there all summer and read books. It was pretty cool. Um, and then I had jobs in at like working at the mall at a clothing store. I, I actually actually lied to get my first job. I was supposed to be 16. I was only 15. I, I skipped kindergarten. So I was, I was ahead of the, the curve. I was, I was a year younger than all of my friends. 
and I really wanted a job. I really wanted to make money. And I totally lied about my age and said I was 16 and mm -hmm. just hadn't had my license yet, but you should totally hire me. Okay. So now you're, you tried beer <laughs> and you're lying. Yeah. I'm not impressed. I know you shouldn't be. <laughs> you shouldn't We're, be. No, in all seriousness, mm -hmm. I, I, I was totally joking. I know. In all seriousness. So was your family kind of middle class? Was it lower yeah. middle class? What, what did your parents do for work? So, yeah. So my, my mom was a stay at home mom. Um, right up until I was kind of in elementary school and she had a part-time job working at JC Penney in the payroll department. Um, my father was an educator. So he, um, he had started out as a teacher by the time I came along, he was, a he had moved on to be a principal. He'd gotten his doctorate in, um, education. And so he was Dr. Johnson. Where was he teaching? So he, he taught initially, he taught at Skyline. Um, and, <laughs> And I don't know, I can't think of other, other schools, but schools around this area where he taught. And then he, he became a principal when he, he got his degree. So he was the principal of Holiday Elementary. He was the principal of um, Fortuna Elementary is no longer there. Evergreen Junior High, a lot of Meadowmore Elementary, a lot of these schools okay. just right in this area. And then he uh, was promoted into the um, Granite School District office and was in administration there. It's kind of an assistant an superintendent. Mm -hmm. So religiously, was there a lot mm -hmm. of religious pressure in your home and, and in your teen years? It sounds like there wasn't. So there was and there wasn't. It was a really strange, like I felt a lot of it. I felt a lot of it. We were really expected to go to church and to do the things. Um, probably for context, it would be helpful to know my oldest brother had stopped going to church when he was 13, 14 years old. And he's about 13 years older than I am. So I've never known my brother as being part of the faith. Mm. And he, he and my parents had a really problematic relationship. Um, and he, he really was a naughty teenager, you know, he, mm. um, by Mormon standards, by Mormon standards was a very, very naughty. Um, and my mother really could not handle it. It was really, really difficult. She was not made to have a child like this. They were oil and water. And, um, and so I saw that my, my brother, um, had, uh, was kind of a vol had a volatile temper. And, and to me, I grew up with this idea that that's what happened to you. If you didn't do the church thing, like you became a huge problem. You would be on drugs. You would be doing all these horrible things. Your life would be ruined. And, you know, in, in my family, I will just say, I feel like the pressure to go to college and get a degree and the pressure to be wise with your money and not go into debt mm -hmm. was almost, I, I, I thought it was part of the articles of faith, I think growing up because that was such a, such a, a strong message in my family that this is what you do. And there is something really wrong with you if you don't choose these things. So it was all, it was all wrapped up in my mind that People who did the right things and, and studied and went to college and did and went to church, it was all wrapped up in the same thing. Those were good people and those other people were problematic. So how's your brother doing now? Are you able to say? Yes. No, my brother is amazing. I <laughs> he is. Did I love okay? my brother. Absolutely. It's it, you know, I grew up being kind of intimidated by him a little bit, maybe a little a little scared of him. Um and and there was just a huge rift with my family. He, he in no way could find acceptance in my family. And when we get to my college years, I had a little taste of that myself. And um, so I think some empathy grew in me for what my brother must have experienced his whole life. And that actually helped me forge a relationship with him that I really cherish. And he's, he really, I, I, I look back at the way I saw him growing up and I have a lot of sadness and regret. He was the, the layman or the Lemuel. He the... totally was a layman and Lemuel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't think I didn't think about it as I was reading the book of Mormon as, and you as a young Nephi. person. Uh, oh, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. How, so when you tried to get your, uh, that Moroni 10, four experience yeah. in high school, how'd yeah. that go? It, it, didn't happen. Did you literally read the Book of Mormon cover to cover? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You did? Yeah. At least once. I was always constantly feeling like I should be, but 
was always feeling like I was failing because I've never been a very like disciplined soul. <laughs> so daily practice of anything has always been elusive for me. So I really felt all this pressure. Like if I'm really going to be good, I need to be reading my scriptures every day. I need to be praying morning and night. And I was, I wasn't good at that. I'd go on streaks and then, and I'd feel good about myself for a few minutes and then it, I wouldn't feel so good about it um, when I would slack off. And so I always felt like, well, the, the whole reason I'm not really having that 10 Moroni 10, four experience and really getting that, that really big spiritual confirmation. It just, I, I'm not good enough yet. I'm not doing it well enough yet. So maybe someday, maybe someday I'll get there. Did you read it cover to cover? Yeah. At least once, In maybe more. Yeah. And you, and you knelt down to pray and get oh, yeah. the answer. Yeah. Oh yeah. And? Oh yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Did Nothing. you try a couple of times? Oh yeah. All the time. <laughs> All the trying. time. You kept trying. I kept trying. Oh. I was, I was absolutely a dedicated soul. Mm. I really wanted it. Bummer. Yeah. And I'd hear everyone else's miraculous stories and I just, I just wanted something. I wanted something to happen to me. I wanted some sort of spiritual something. How are you going to find that general 30 husband if you can't even get a firm testimony of the Book of Mormon? Right. 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 It must have been stressful. It was. It was. I never quite felt like I was measuring up. Hmm. And part of that I thought was my family's fault. <laughs> They're just not strict enough. And, not. you know. Faithful enough. They're not faithful Strictly. enough. But it's they, yeah, that's the thing. They're, they were uber faithful. They just weren't very strict about a lot of things. And they were very laissez-faire with me. I mean, when I was going out in high school, and they, I mean, they, they really didn't ask me much about my life. They, they weren't really very involved in any way. I remember asking my parents once in, in high school, like, you know, my friends, like, come home from a date and their parents will actually ask them, how was the date? <laughs> you know? And I, I think it made my mom really sad. She, she, she just felt like I was telling her she was a terrible mother. And, mm -hmm. and my dad was just, I'm not here to be your friend. <laughs> so <laughs> it, 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 looking back, I, it was actually a pretty lonely ex uh, existence. My, my siblings had all moved away and were married and, and I was kind of doing it on my own. I don't know. So, okay. So you go to Satan's Den, which is the University <laughs> of Utah. Did. Yeah. You don't go to BYU, which I is don't. just a red flag for me. Well, literally. Can I? Can I? Literally. Can I make it worse? I had a full ride scholarship to BYU that I passed up. What? In what? Academics. Academics. Yeah. And you turned down the I, Lord's University. I turned down the is Lord's University. Is that just Salt Lake culture or what? Or is it the red hair? <laughs> Uh, you know, for me, I think I had, I, and I was intrigued about BYU just getting away from home. Um, but I don't know, there was something I think intuitively, intuitively in me that knew that the culture of BYU was not a fit for me. And so, um, I decided to go to the university of Utah, which I had also had a scholarship too. I didn't, you know, I was choosing between did you move off? Did things. you stay home or? I, I started out, but I lasted about a month <laughs> into in the, it. In the dorms? It, no, I lasted about a month at home Oh. until I met some friends in a singles ward and immediately moved out. And that was a really, really good decision for me. I, I thrived being more independent. Um, I thrived in some ways. <laughs> I think as far as my, my Mormonism, I, it maybe wasn't the best thing for me for all of those goals and lofty goals I had for myself. But So the you, that those early years at the U mm -hmm. weren't putting you on that spiritual track? So I was trying. I took Institute. I really loved um, some of my Institute teachers and loved the Institute up there. Um, got involved in the LDS sororities that were going at the time and met some good people in that first year. Um, but early on, probably, um, I think the, the winter of that first year, I ended up meeting a, a guy that I dated for several years. And he, I was really, really, really into this guy. I just fell head over heels for him. And he did was he meet your patriarchal blessing criteria. He did not. He what? did not. What? He did not. He, he was a Mormon 
And so, you know, part of me is just like, well, he's a Mormon. We can do this. And, you know, it'll be OK. But it was not his interest to be that kind of a Mormon that I wanted. You know, and meanwhile, I was actually writing a missionary at the time. Um, but I just I just I did. I fell for this guy. And f over the next several years, over my college experience, I was basically in a personal hell because I believed so much in the church. I still had all of those feelings of what I wanted to be. I still had um, all of those messages from my patriarchal blessing. I knew who I was supposed to be dating, who I was supposed to be marrying, but I was so emotionally attached to this guy, my college boyfriend. Were you sinning? Is that what you're saying? I, I was sinning, yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so you felt guilty about that. I felt super guilty. Super guilty. But you liked him a lot. I liked him a lot, yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, we 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 fought like cats and dogs. So it wasn't like it was a, a terribly healthy relationship. I did not learn, like as I said, I didn't learn very good um, relationship skills, social skills. That was not the forte of my family. Um, my family is a lot of really, really good things. My parents were really good people. And that was not the best. I didn't have the best modeling of any of that. So it was turbulent. It was really, really turbulent. So, okay. so when people, and thanks for being vulnerable. I don't mean to make yeah. light of that. And I'm not, yeah. I don't really believe it's sinning. And I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of asking these questions from a Mormon framework, but, well, for but, sure. it, but we don't, we usually interview people who go to BYU mm -hmm. and we haven't interviewed a lot of youths mm. and something that's very different about the U of U for those who mm. aren't Mormon or who don't know about the U of U you don't have the honor code you're supposed to be living under. It's, right. it's a state school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you are sinning, and mm -hmm. by sinning we mean, you know, let's just say law of chastity stuff, mm -hmm. uh, normal, normative, healthy sexual stuff, yep. for example. Yep. Um, at BYU, you've either got to hide it or lie, or you get in trouble and you get mm -hmm. kicked out. And that's just, but at the U, you don't, you don't have that. But you're still trying to go to church. So yeah. what's that like oh, yeah. navigating, let's just say, um, uh, a less than obedient or from a Mormon standpoint, standpoint moral perspective yeah. as a college student at the U? Yeah, it was awful for me. Why? Why like, was it so awful? Because I had such high expectations for myself. And when I would read that patriarchal blessing, I would just know that I was failing. I was failing. Um, you know, I, I was not living up to what I should, that why would I ever have a spiritual experience being mm. who I am? Um, I, and so I would, I would stop going to church for a while and for a period of time. And then I would, cause the guilt, it was just the guilt. It was just the guilt that would keep me away. Um, and then I, you know, okay, I was, so I, I've asked this question before, forgive yeah. me. Cause I know yeah. it's not that simple, but like, if you believe and yep. this is this is how I don't want to sound douchey, but that's probably a bad word. I don't want to sound <laughs> bad, but like for me, it was like, no, you believe, so you act how you believe. Yeah, that's not how one is, and I'm not saying I yeah. was better because I I had my comeuppance later. Mm -hmm. How do you believe but not, not act according it. to your beliefs? Yeah, it 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 was. That's why it was so hard. That's why I was in such turmoil. I was in such inner turmoil. I had this relationship I was so into, but it wasn't healthy. It wasn't a healthy relationship. Um, and where I really would have gone for solace is the church, but I felt guilty. Mm. So I would, I would, I moved your parents to weren't people you could really go to. Oh no. So you're kind of alone. Oh yeah. I was oh, very, very much alone. A hard time. It was a hard time. It really was. Um, you know, and I, I, at one point I remember telling one of my sisters that I hadn't been going to church and that got back to my mother. And my mom was never, she's never been direct. She just gets very passive aggressive, right? And so I could just feel a coldness from her that I know she, she loved me, but it was hard to feel her love during that time. And she would just make comments to me like, you're probably inside, where, where are your, um, where are your membership records? Do you even know? 
Like they're probably, you're probably in some lost box at the, <laughs> at the church office building. It's the first time I'd heard of a lost box. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I am. I don't know. But it was, it, I, I was, I was very rebellious in my attitude toward it because it was, I couldn't handle how cold it was. It was really, really painful. Like I really look back at those years and they were super, super painful. Um, and it's kind of like all the support systems you should be able to draw from mm -hmm. your parents, mm -hmm. your faith, mm -hmm. you're kind of, you're kind of cut off from. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, I was. Yeah. So I would move to a different apartment, you know, like I had lots of different friends that I lived with roommates all through college. I'd never lived on campus. We just lived in apartments around Salt Lake City and I would move to a new one and I would, this would be my new start and I'm going to go to the new singles ward and I'm going to turn over a new leaf <laughs> and it would last about a month. And then I was just back to work. And I, and I would, the first thing I would do is make the appointment with the bishop so I could go absolve myself. So you would do the confessions? Oh, stuff. yeah. I don't know how many like? confessionals I've been to so in my life. <laughs> for those who don't know, or just so that we have a sense, what yeah. was that like, the repeated confessions with the bishop? So one of the interesting parts is that I got a wide sampling of what bishops were like. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that not all bishops handle these things the same way, right? So some would be like, Oh, well, well, thanks for telling me and, you know, maybe skip the sacrament and, you know, slap on the wrist and whatever. And it was interesting because, I mean, for me, it felt like that wasn't enough. I, ha I There was not enough penance and it just wouldn't stick. And so I would just go back to my same old life and stop going to church again. And this went on, on and off for probably three years or so. Um. And during that time, some of my friends were going on missions. And I remember thinking for half a second, like, I always kind of thought I'd go on a mission. But by the time I got there, I'm like, well, I'm so far away from a mission, you know, that there's no way this is going to happen for me. In we've talked about this, you know, there are these metaphors you're taught about the law of chastity, like chewed gum or, oh, yeah. you know, a, um, a licked cupcake, oh, yeah. you know. Did, did those, oh. is that how you, you felt? You know, it's definitely how I felt. I don't remember having those specific, oh, yeah. uh, I, I, I was spared those specific uh, <laughs> lessons. I do remember one, however, uh, one lesson stuck with me in young women's of how to stay chaste while being chaste. I think about that one a Ooh. lot. <laughs> I thought it was very clever. Very clever. Very clever. And so many messed up messages in that one sentence. But, um, I, I definitely, um, felt that way about myself. And again, back to the, the patriarchal blessing reference. I mean, it told me to guard my virtue as my very life. So everything about what I was doing, I just felt like a failure out on top of this. Like it, it didn't take a lot for me to feel like a failure. And I think I should say this. I, I remember at one point of in high school, um, I, I remember talking to my mom just before I got married and telling her, like, I felt like such a failure in high school. But when I look back, <laughs> what did I do? Like, I, I, I drank alcohol once. I didn't keep my room clean. I dropped from a 4.0 to a 3.7. And it, so it wasn't enough to get the highest scholarship. I just got tuition. I didn't get paid on top of it. Um, and I felt like a failure. I felt like an absolute failure. And at the time when I'm telling my mom this, she said, well, I felt like a total disappointment. She said, well, you kind of were, oh. that's the perfectionism oh. that I was, that's the pressure I was under. So in college, what also went along with this is I'm not staying on top of all my schoolwork. Now, when I pay attention to school, I can get a 4.0. I, I do well in school. My my skill set is well suited for the education system we go through. So I know I can do well in school. And I didn't, and I lost my scholarship. It was, oh. it was a four-year scholarship, but I had to maintain a specific GPA. Um, I held onto it by the skin of my teeth for the first three years, but lost it for that fourth year. And again, just felt like a complete failure. What and were you studying? I was studying accounting, which is another kind of a sore spot for me now. <laughs> um, 
my first love was science. My first love was like, I was really interested in medical school. Um, I chose accounting because that's something that I saw some of my cousins and, and people I knew doing from home. And so my degree was always my backup plan, right? It was not something that I was ever going to do because I am supposed to be a mother, a wife and a mother, which is interesting because I, I don't think that was necessarily a really strong message at, in my home other than my mom did that. Example. It, just example. But my older sister has always planned on having a career. You know, she went into metallurgical engineering and was planning on law school and has always had a big, you know, career her whole life. And it never bothered her. I, and again, I, I look back <laughs> and I cringe at my old self, but I was very judgmental of her choices of having a career because I think I was in so much pain over my own, what I was giving up, what I knew I was giving up so that I could be a mom. So accounting was not my first love by mm -hmm. any stretch of the imagination, but I knew it was practical and I knew there was a lot of flexibility and there's a lot of ways to do accounting if I ever needed to. Really quickly, you mentioned different types of bishops. You mentioned the lenient mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. Were there some super strict ones? There were some super strict ones. Um, so there was one that um, I connected to. I'm trying to think. It was in my early 20s. Um, I think I'd finally broken from my uh, my college boyfriend for good. Um, we kept breaking up and getting back together for years. But um, I think I'd moved past that and like I was bound and determined to make this one stick and I'm getting back into activity in the church. And I remember it, uh, going to a therapist for the first time back then um, and that was one of the first things she said to me and helped me really understand was that what I was doing in my life was so completely different from my values, so completely different from my beliefs that of course I'm miserable, right? So there was no way for me to give up the beliefs at the time. So I am like, I've got it. I've got to white knuckle this and I've got to straighten up and fly right. And then life will be good and I'll meet my Prince Charming, right? my, my budding Mormon apostle. So <laughs> people have you. <laughs> and that was always the, the question, like, yeah. have I blown it? That was, that was the big question on my heart. Have I blown it? So just, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pausing just to think about, um, this dual utility that religion often has. Yeah. Cause on the one hand it gives you standards. It gives you something to live for. It, it helps, gives you something to strive for. Absolutely. Meaning, purpose, identity, um, rules to keep you out of trouble. Yep. And that, that can work for a time. Mm -hmm. It, it also has its dark side yep. kind of, you know, whether it's pride or, you know, whatever. Yep. Um, but then there's a dark side to that mm -hmm. because if you're not living up to it all, you j you can feel crappy and Absolutely. the thing that's supposed to be helpful and useful and strengthening to you makes you miserable, makes you feel awful. And it's, it's, it's weird when it can have that dark side. And that was definitely my experience with it. Um, you know, I think again, because of my upbringing, because of my personality, I took it in a really, really dark way. It was really hard. I mean, it was, it was good. It was good to keep me like having that kind of a, um, a North star on the horizon that I was moving toward. Um, but during those years, it was more of a weapon to beat myself up with. Um, and until I met this, the, this amazing Bishop in this, this singles ward that I finally, this, this started to take, right. Um, I was really dedicated to coming back to the church and, um, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't go swimmingly. I was still kind of in and out of things, but, um, after I'd worked with this Bishop for a while, with him seeing me make my resolutions and then slip and make resolutions and slip. I, um, he, he finally pulled me into his office one day and he said, look, you need to know that you have paid enough for what you have done 
that you can live up to what is in your patriarchal blessing. He had actually, um, you know, this, this is a guy who really cared a lot. He was very strict, but he cared a lot. Um, and I had gone in to confess one more slip up with the, the guy I was dating. And he said, you need, you know, this, this guy was not a member of the church. He said, you need to break up with him. You need to break up with him tonight. And I'm going to wait for you. <laughs> and he sent me out to break up with this guy and then was waiting for me till like 11 o'clock at night, pacing the halls of the church, waiting for me. That's intense. Yeah. And at the time it felt like, someone actually cared because that's what I'd always been looking for was to someone to make me be good enough. Right. So he actually offered that to me at a time when I really needed it. So I get back, he's pacing, he's waiting for me. He asked me to bring my patriarchal blessing with me. He read it, that intense patriarchal blessing. And I remember him reading it out loud to me and then he just looked up at me and he said, does that just sound like a bunch of words? And I said, yeah, it kind of does at this point. And he just looked me straight in the eye and he said, then what is the atonement for? And he offered me a, a view of the atonement that I'd never really grasped before. And in that place where I was, where I was so distraught, it, it was the one thing that brought me hope that maybe I could be okay, that maybe I haven't given up everything that I um, thought I had because I hadn't been faithful enough. Um, and he actually convened a, a disciplinary council for me, which for someone who was not endowed and for the level of things that I'd done, it, it, it's extraordinary. I don't think most bishops would have done that. But he did. He brought me in, went through. A, it was just, you know, on the ward level. And it was excruciating. One of my, one of my accounting professors was in the bishopric <laughs> and s sat there and listened to my whole story. It was humiliating. It was sickening. But... I didn't mind it at the time because this was penance. I needed the penance. I needed to feel badly about enough, badly enough about myself. I needed to, I, it, I deserved this. I deserved to be humiliated. And I just remember them shutting the door on me and, and waiting for an hour and a half while they deliberated. And when I came back in, they said, you were within a hair's breadth of being disfellowshipped, but we're just, we're going to, put you on probation. So I feel like I crawled back to the church on, in sackcloth and ashes, feeling like I am the worst. And they handed me a copy of Miracle Forgiveness and said, read this. And that also kind of killed my soul a little bit reading that. I remember the phrase that stuck out to me was that um, sexual sin seems to be forgivable. It never gives you the <laughs> the feeling that maybe it really is. It, was, it seems to be forgivable. It seems to be. So it was. It it left a lot of questions on my mind. You know, it, even though this bishop, I think, who really was a really astounding person, was really trying to give me what I needed. And actually, at the time, it is what I needed because anyone who was too lenient on me, it wasn't enough. I needed someone to be really mean to me. And he, he wasn't mean. I don't want to come across. He wasn't. He was very, very, very loving, but very strict and very like took it very, very seriously. So. Um, so I am super, I'm touched. I mean, you're getting emotional. Yeah. I'm touched by it. Yeah. And I'm conflicted. And I just yeah. want to explore this with you a tiny bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on the one hand, I see you as feeling kind of aimless, like life isn't going great. Yep. You don't have the parental support. Yep. You're kind of just not feeling great about yourself yeah. and not going in a, in a great direction. And here, this committed loving man, that's probably got all sorts of other commitments or things he can be, he takes an interest in Jana. Yep. 
And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to like, not just be one another Bishop. I'm going to like show up for you and challenge you and, and really try and reach you. Yeah. And I'm going to like, wait until you go break up with this guy and come back. And then I'm going to hold a disciplinary council, not to punish you, not to hurt you, but yeah. because I know you feel like, you know, you need this kind of like a uh, process to repent. Absolutely. So on the one hand, that just feels amazing. Yes. Okay. So you're feeling things. What are you feeling? Yeah, no, I'm feeling I'm come that. to the second part, but. I'm feeling that like his intuition in knowing that that is what I needed was astounding. Like he, I remember reading, you know, because he's, he, he read all about the budding Mormon, um, uh, apostle that I was, was waiting for me. Right. He said, when you get married in the temple and you're kneeling across the altar from this guy, you need to know that you've paid enough that you deserve to be there. And he knew that. And it, his words rang true to me. That was exactly what I needed to get to that point. And it, it really does sound like he helped. This was a pivotal moment in your life. Huge. That kind of turned your life around, right? Huge. And it was the basis of my testimony. So I never had the Mormon, the Moroni 10 4 experience. Never did. Never did. Didn't ever stop trying to have it. Never got it. But that was the basis of my testimony was, well, look at that. I went in feeling like a piece of poop. And I came out of that feeling like someone cared about me. Someone saw me. Someone I looked up to who was super righteous saw something in me and cared enough to do that. Maybe I'm going to be okay. And look at what the atonement can do. Even though that Miracle of Forgiveness book was horrific, I'm really trying to feel like the atonement is real enough that I can still have everything that I dreamed of for myself. Yeah, it's it's, it's in, on one hand beautiful and mm -hmm. inspirational. Yeah, yep, it carried me for a lot of years. Yeah, a lot of years. So this may not be the time to talk about it, but yeah. I'm also going to give you my negative reaction, right? Yeah, because I'm like, you're a grown ass woman. <laughs> yeah. You're doing normative things, yeah. health, sexual, you know, mm -hmm. whatever normative stuff mm -hmm. by any other standard. Mm -hmm. You feel awful in part because the church has made you feel awful. And that's why you're on this treadmill of unworthiness because the church has made you feel awful. And then like just the boundaries of like what 30, 40, 50 year old man has the right to be talking to some 20 something young girl about her sexual behaviors, telling her she's like telling her what is right and wrong. And then even mm -hmm. like telling her if she's okay or not. Like I'm thinking, wow, the real healthy path might've been for you to get comfortable with your sexuality, learn that you're okay, mm -hmm. not have to like feel like this Bishop and Jesus and the atonement in the church all rescued you when you really weren't lost. You were lost in life, mm -hmm. but you weren't necessarily lost in sin. You were just kind of doing normal stuff. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so there is this trope that kind of ex Mormons sometimes lay at the church that yeah. the church creates the illness and then presents itself as, as a cure. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. that your story has a bit of echoes of that for me, yeah. but I'm, it's not my job to interpret your story. Yeah. And I know you just got through crying because this meant so much to you. Yep. So, I mean, I don't know. I, it, it's not my place to even offer an interpretation, but those are some secondary thoughts that come through my mind. I, As I say those things, does any of that resonate with you? For sure. I mean, I I can read this story as I look back on it in so many different ways. On the one hand, yeah, I mean, it, 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 the church did set this up for me. And so did my family and my personality and all of my experiences. Like, you know, talking to my, one of my sisters, she did not take in the church this way in all of these horrific ways that it needed to present itself as the cure. She was a very different person. And for her, it's just been this really, really lovely place for her in her entire life. Right. So I don't know that I can just say that the church sets this up for everybody, but it definitely can it definitely can. 
you know, I mean, I'm the, I'm the first person, my personality is one where I just look for, I, I see problems because I'm a perfectionist. This is what happens when you're a perfectionist. You lay any system out for me and I will beeline in on what is wrong with it. And I'm the first to do that. <laughs> um, and I can do that with the church all day long. We would be here for three days if you wanted me to tell you what I thought was wrong with the church, because I can see it very, very clearly. Um, but I couldn't at the time. So putting it in the context of the time, um, I, I took it all on myself, yeah. right? I took it all on myself. So yes, I think what you're saying is right. I look back on that disciplinary action, disciplinary action and I see both in it. I see my salvation. I see exactly what I needed at the time. I, I see a loving kindness that presented itself in a love that I could accept because of my upbringing. And I see all of the things you said too. Cause, cause maybe a, a more succinct way to describe yep. it is there was nothing wrong with you. You weren't right. broken. You weren't, For you sure. were doing great, Yep. but you felt you I were did. made to feel like you, there was something wrong with you Absolutely. and that you needed a savior. A hundred percent. But hundred percent. But the reality is, it helped turn you around it and did. put you on a direction that you mm -hmm. felt happy to go on. And Absolutely. who am I to say that was good or bad? Right? right. Like, right. And who's and for you? It was experienced as it was. It was pivotal. It was beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. I asked that man to be there when I did get married. Yeah. I wanted him there because that was such a an yeah. image and a hope that he'd put in my mind that I had paid for it and I deserved it, and I wanted him there to see it. And I was totally composed on the day of my wedding until I walked into the sailing room and saw him there and I lost it because I knew he'd gotten me there. That's, I, I, that's how I felt at the time that he was pivotal in getting me there. So, um, so yeah, so about, about, about a year after that, um, <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, I was just not prone to be the, the best kind of Mormon, even though I wanted it so badly in my heart. I was just never disciplined enough, and I just wanted people to like me just enough. And I, I just was always making choices that betrayed myself. So at one point, I just thought, well, this is, I remember a, a sister of mine saying, well, maybe you should just go through the temple. Maybe you should just go take out your endowments. And I laughed. I'm like, oh, that's the last thing I should be doing. Because then when I screw up, I'll be really screwed. This is the way I, <laughs> I thought about it. I'm like, I'm not going to bring that condemnation on myself because I know myself. But it started working on me. And within about a month, I thought, you know what? This is actually, maybe that's my problem. My problem is I give myself too many outs. So if I go to the temple, maybe that will finally fix me. Because then I'll be scared enough that I won't screw up again. So I started making plans and a year later I went through the temple hmm. and didn't not connected to mission, not connected to marriage. I just went on my own and that became a really important spiritual practice for me. I would go to the temple once a week on my way to work and, um, became quite the little temple goer. And for those who weren't raised LDS, mm -hmm. you know, that's when you get your garments, that's where mm -hmm. you make these extra special covenants to obey the law of chastity, to the law of consecration, mm -hmm. obedience, mm -hmm. to give everything to the church, and big promises, promises to mm -hmm. become a god or a goddess someday, but big punishment, big threats by Lucifer mm -hmm. if you turn away. So it kind of, it's 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 a bit of a risk, like you said, yeah. but but it can really boost you into hyper righteousness. Absolutely, no no one likes Satan looking me in the eyes, telling <laughs> me that, that I can't go astray to to scare me into into the straight and narrow. So, were you even aware of kind of the the stuff that feminists have complained about over the years, the whole hearkening into the Lord and the veiling of the face and all the things that. So feminism, basically, no patriarchy. I'm, no, it was just no. righteousness and goodness. It was righteousness and goodness. <laughs> I was completely oblivious to all of that. And I think maybe part of it was, you know, even just making promises through the husband. Like I didn't have anyone there. I was making promises through. I don't know. It did not seem, I, it didn't even phase me. I was like the goldfish in the water that doesn't know what water is. Right. 
It just was, this is what it is. Of course it is. Now I'm just going to really figure out why. I was always like delving in. I want to understand all the covenants. I want I want to understand everything about. There's some deep mystery here that I'm going to figure out. <laughs> and I'm going to spend an hour in the celestial room. And I'm just going to soak it in. And, and I'm going to get all these spiritual experiences that will just help it all make sense to me. That was, that was my goal. What about the really gnarly Masonic penalties? Had, had, those been, had they been removed? They had. They I was, had it was removed. 93, I okay, believe. So 94. That. It was 90 yeah. when those went away. It was, yeah, okay, it was 90 so when those went away. So I was I was unaware. <laughs> Although my, my aunt at one point was like, oh, you missed this phrase and told me some phrase that was in the temple before. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking Paleo. about. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, one. that's the one. I'm like, what's that? But but also just you know, the gnarly stuff. I won't get into the gnarly it. stuff. I I missed the gnarly stuff. So it was just all like a mystery. And I will say, I had a great stake president. That for those who are prepping anyone to go to the temple, this is the advice I would give. This guy was great. He's like, we are way too weird and secretive about the temple. Like he sat me down and said, look. You need to know what's going to happen here. My guess is he'd had women and men going through just freaking out. Like, what was that? You know, he sat me down and said, they're really just signs and tokens. Those are the things that are sacred and secret. The rest we can talk about. So this is what's going to happen. And he took me through the whole thing, told me what was going to happen before I got there. Told me to go home, buy the clothes, look at them, know what everything is. Like, he kind of took the mystery out of it for me. I'm really grateful because I don't know if it would have been like, completely freaky to me if he hadn't done that. Nice. Yeah. So I was okay. well prepped. Okay. It was good. It was a good experience. The temple was a great place for me. Um, so graduated from college, actually got through by the skin of my teeth. So <laughs> got a, yeah. Okay. Got, had had a, a bachelor's in accounting. I considered a master's in accounting, considered an MBA, started both of those programs, decided they weren't for me. I was kind of still kind of listless a little bit, started working, um, and then just kind of got a wild hair and said, I just want to move out of state. I had a friend that was living in San Diego at the time. I went to visit her. My, the company I was working for had an office in uh, Long Beach. And I, so I went and talked to them while I was down there and they offered me a job and I just said, peace out. I'm out of here. I'm 24. I'm not married in Utah. I felt like an old maid because you know, 24 is just so old and <laughs> not married. Okay. Wait, I'm thinking back to my interview with Heather Gay Yeah. and she talked about the Long Beach ward. There's, there's so kind it's of the Huntington Beach ward. Oh, so it's not Long Beach. So the, I worked in Long Beach, but I was part of the Huntington Beach. I okay, lived okay. in Huntington Beach and I was the Huntington Beach ward. Okay, and so it you, was, did the, you did the plan. I did the Huntington Beach <laughs> ward and it, it's the same ward that I met my husband in that, Hello, that Heather met Billy in. So, so. I guess, I guess mm -hmm. you, if, if you're single from Utah yeah. and you want to do things right and you're, and you're not married by the time you get out of college, you either go to a DC and go to the single wards yes. in DC or you go Colonial to Ward, right? Ward. Yeah. yeah. Or you go to Huntington Heard Beach, all about. Right? So you yes. did it. I did. I did the Huntington Beach. I didn't know anything about the Huntington Beach Ward. I was actually had my eyes on Newport. I was like Newport. But I called them. They had a calling for a housing coordinator. And I talked to the housing coordinator trying to find a roommate. And they said, you, you know, this ward's great, but you really want to go to Huntington. <laughs> so I did. I found a roommate in Huntington Beach and moved down there. So it's kind of a, I don't want to say meat market. Can you say meat market? It, it totally is. <laughs> and and it like doubled in size over the summer because all the BYU kids would come home for the summer. And so it was a gigantic ward. Huge, huge. In fact, it, it's since been split from, from what I understand into two. So was two, that fun? But was it awesome? It was fun. It was just fun to, you know, I, I think... I've, I've always kind of romanticized these new starts, you know, that was another new start. Like I can go to a new place and no one knows me and I can start over because I still had all of this lingering, like really not feeling good about myself, still wondering if I was good enough from my childhood that I could never quite shake, but it was really fun. Um, and I actually really wanted to just kind of date around when I got there, but of course I met my husband, Rob, um, down there about a month in to after I moved into the ward and he was the elders quorum president, John, it was like, I could see the writing on the wall that here was my Mormon apostle. <laughs> so you got to date the elders quorum president. I dated the elders quorum oh. president, right? 
So <laughs> your dreams coming started to come true. It was all coming out, together. Out of the younger repents. <laughs> it was all coming together. <laughs> Elma, Elma the Younger was always my favorite story for obvious reasons. Yes. Um, so yeah. So met my husband. Can I just know yeah. that it's it's a bit of a sad thing that we had to mention Nephi and Elma the Younger for a woman <laughs> like right? Book of Mormon. Can you give us some female? Please. Can you give us some female characters that our that our young women can uh, look up to Seriously. instead of a bunch of men? <laughs> Seriously. What's funny is I never even noticed that. I'm like I can be Nephi. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. I, that's fine. I don't know. I, I definitely had, that's one thing I can say about my parents. They were very egalitarian. If anything, my mom kind of wore the pants. Like my dad was very kind. There was a lot of really benevolent patriarchy around me that, that I just didn't notice. I didn't notice any of the problems with it at all. I just felt like, and I, I've always had, I've always been outspoken. I've always had kind of a strong personality. And so I don't know. I just felt like everyone listened to me anyway. I can be Nephi. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this isn't a problem. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, so you start dating Rob. Start and... dating Rob. And um, we dated for, I think, about nine months before we got engaged and then got married, um, came up to Salt Lake City, got married in the Salt Lake Temple. Um, what year was that? That was in 1998 on Friday the 13th of November. Super fun. Um, and then we lived in, uh, in um, oh my gosh, what's the name of it? Oh, Lake Forest. Lake Forest, California. Down by Mission Viejo and Irvine, kind of Orange County. So did, did uh, the, you, don't, you can share this if you want. I'm just curious. Did mm. you like have to have that moment where you sit Rob down and say, I haven't been the person <laughs> that you probably wanted me to be. Do you still love me? Yeah. Yeah. Was, oh, oh yeah. Was that before or after the It was I think after we were engaged, but before <laughs> we got married. I wanna say I think it was before and we don't after we tell got engaged. Story, but is, is there anything you want to share from your perspective about <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, I mean I, I think I think it was hard. Like he had always followed the rules. Like he he I don't wanna necessarily totally tell his story, but I will say he grew up out of um, he grew up in Maryland with not as many Mormons, right? And he, his family was, his parents were converts. And, um, you know, he was definitely the most dedicated person in his family to the church. You know, it was, it all was coming from him, but he didn't feel a ton of pressure growing up. And he went to BYU, not knowing, not really intending to serve a mission, but decided in his first year to do that. And, and he's, he's, he is a, just a really, good, dutiful guy, right? That's just his personality. And so of course that was like a huge draw for me. That's what I, I want that. I want that dutiful guy. Right. Um, so yeah, he, he had made sure to, you know, keep himself within certain bounds. So that was a hard conversation for sure to let him know that that hasn't been my, my story. Um, I think he did struggle with it a little bit and I, I kind of, I, I was kind of proud of myself. I kind of got on my high horse for a minute going, well, you don't get the atonement if you don't, you know, <laughs> if you don't <laughs> accept me. So you better get yourself right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we had a little bit of that moment. He came around. He's like, yeah, you're right. Okay. It's good. You know, but, but I think it was hard. I think this is hard for people growing up in Mormonism. This is really, really hard. If you've been the one to keep yourself pure and someone else hasn't, right? It's, it's, it's hard. I remember Natasha Helfer talking about mm -hmm. that um, and, and how it played in her relationship with yeah. with uh, Andy, her yeah. husband. And yeah. It can bring this weird power dynamic to a relationship or guilt and superiority, or it can just kind of level out and, uh, you know, not a big deal, but it, it, it can be pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. No, like I, I, it I think it okay. has, it turned out okay. And I think it does leave it, leave its mark. And yeah. I don't want to minimize it. Like, mm -hmm. I think it, it was really hard. It was a hard moment for both of us. So, so yeah, so we get married after uh, about eight months, we moved back up to Salt Lake so that we could buy a home with one salary so that I could be the good stay at home mom that we both really wanted me to be. Right. Um, 
And so we moved to Utah, uh, moved to Sugar House, got our first cute little house oh, in Sugar House. Nice. It was nice. Um, what was the home in Sugar House worth back then? Uh, I think we paid about 180 for it. Oh, wow. What yeah. would it be now? I've heard some in those that like are going for half a million. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I don't know for teeny, sure. Teeny, 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 teeny like 900 square feet on each floor, <laughs> you know? And, but it was a, such a cute little neighborhood, made a lot of good friends in that ward. And, um, I, I struggled even a little bit then kind of a little bit with activity. I, I, I had this little period of time there where I started to scare my husband. <laughs> I think I scared him a little bit because I, I would just be like, oh yeah, I'm just not feeling well today. I'm just not going to go. And I'd have little periods of time when it would be like that. I remember getting into it with the Relief Society president in that ward a little bit because she, I was the Relief Society chorister. She took this very, very seriously. I did not. I thought you can ask anyone to stand up and flap their arms for two seconds. You are fine. <laughs> but she, she was, she, I think I went to her once to, you know, make some, you know, kind of comment. I would always try to find someone ahead of time to, to fill in for me, or I would have Rob, you know, scramble for someone during sacrament meeting or whatever, but it stressed her out to not have me be the one there every time. And I think she threw some number at me. You've only been here X out of 20 weeks. And, you know, it, it, it was not good. I remember thinking, why would I want to continue to go to church when this is the kind of environment I'm in? I, this, I don't like this. Okay. So there's this term called the backslider. I'm thinking about this <laughs> novel by Levi Peterson, an early Mormon stories interviewee mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm you know, you, you feel the guilt and then you mm -hmm. repent and then you feel supercharged yeah. and then you start backsliding. Yeah. Are you backsliding? I, a little bit. I think a little bit, but not in big ways. Okay. So I wasn't feeling really too bad about it, but I do remember, I do remember being at work and it was, you know, I'd worked late. And I remember getting on the internet and I remember, I don't even know how I found it, but I came across some ex-Mormon website Around what year? Oh gosh, that would have been, you know, 2000, okay. something like that. And I remember just being super intrigued and I remember reading things and I just remember having all my judgment of these people are so angry and they're just so, and, and I love to argue. It's like, it, it, that was definitely something that I learned in my family growing up. My dad loves to debate things. And <laughs> so I had that in me. So I would get on some of these little chat rooms and discuss with people and try to tell them how wrong they were. <laughs> and it didn't last very long. And I remember not telling Rob about it for a while. And then I finally did. And I'm like, so I've been reading this stuff and it's kind of interesting. And he was just like, what are you reading? What are you doing? And I remember him getting really like upset with me. And I don't like it when people are upset with me. I get defiant. I just get defiant. So... <sighs> I remember little moments of that, but do you remember what the types of issues would have been you were learning about? Cause this would have been AOL chat kind of yeah. stuff. Like yeah, is... it was a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, early days of the internet. I, uh, I, I don't remember okay, specifically. That's fine. that's fine. I don't, I just remember hearing about like, no man knows my history. And I remembering, you know, knowing that Von Brody was, you know, an antichrist and, <laughs> You know, this is all anti-Mormon stuff and feeling totally guilty and doing it when, you know, no one's, no one's watching kind of stuff. This and is really, around the time I lost my faith, two, okay. 2000, 2001. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, maybe I was seeing, seeing you in there somewhere, John, <laughs> reading your, your stuff, but, um, yeah. I wasn't I, public yet. I wasn't it, public yet. It really didn't, it really didn't like affect my faith in any way. Mm -hmm. I was super intrigued. I've always been super intrigued mm -hmm. with people and just how people do things and what's going on with that. This is, this is kind of forbidden. I'm kind of interested in this. Right. But it didn't really do anything. If anything, I just, it just kind of fortified me. Um, and then not long after that, I would say, um, so went through a period of infertility. That was kind of the next thing. Um, was it hard? It was hard. Um, it was hard and, you know, all those doubts coming up of, am I not good enough to get the blessings? Is it, you know, is this me still 
always kind of at the back of my mind. Did you have in your mind that maybe your unfaithfulness, mm-hmm. quote unfaithfulness, yep. would have left you? Yep. I mean, I'm not trying to project that. No, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think I had those kind of, um, I don't think they were pervasive, but I think they were in the back of my mind for sure. So I remember bearing my testimony once in church during that time. And, and, oh, and this was another kind of a thing. So I grew up, um, you know, playing the piano and being very musical. And those were all the callings that I always had from the time I was, you know, coming back to church and getting more, um, more active again. It had always been music callings, always, always, always the first thing that I would be swept into. And I remember feeling like Rob was always having, like he, we were, he was elders quorum president down there. We move up to Utah and they make him elders quorum president up there. And he's always having these leadership callings. And I'm always feeling like, well, Rob's the spiritual one. I'm not really very spiritual. You know, I, I'm still not quite good enough. Maybe if, maybe if I get a good enough calling, then I'm always looking for other things to affirm my worth. Right. I was always looking for other people, callings, something to affirm who I was. So I just remember bearing my testimony once and then the bishop called us in and was like, um, and, and, and said, I, uh, and it, it would have been a state calling. So I don't know how this, but I, I remember the bishop telling us it was you bearing your testimony that made me want to make Rob the elders corn president. Uh-huh. Oh, that was, that was just cause I was just so faithful. Right. Um, and I think I was just kind of r- grappling with the infertility and, and making sense of it and why it was meant to be. And, you know, all of the, the narratives that at the time felt very faith promoting for me. And I ended up, um, having uh, to go through in vitro twice. My first two kids are in vitro babies. Mm-hmm. And then we had a third miracle baby. Um, but, uh, during that time I'd had my first child, she was about a year old. We moved to the neighborhood where I, I live now, not the exact house I'm in, but in the, in that neighborhood and holiday. And I remember just saying to the Bishop when I moved in, you know, I've only ever had music callings. I would really love to serve somewhere else if you have enough people. You know, but if, of course, if you need a music person, of course, I'll do that. Do whatever you want. Right. But I would really, really like to explore. And so for that first time in that word, I did, I was able to serve in different places in the church and start to feel a little more confident in what I had to offer back to the church. Um, but to, so I served in young women's for four years, um, discovered that I love teaching. I would have never known that I love teaching if I hadn't had that experience. Um, Ended up holding uh, callings like gospel doctrine teacher in that ward. I feel like I grew a lot spiritually in the time that I was in that ward um, as far as just gaining confidence in who I was. And Rob continued to serve in elders corn presidencies because <laughs> that's what he does. He's on the track. <laughs> he was on the track. He was. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, he probably is. I'm on the edge of my seat. Well, <laughs> he may still be. I don't think so, though, because I'm you know, the lead weight well, in his don't shoes. Give the story away. <laughs> don't give the story away. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. So, infertility. So, everything's going kids, along. I have three kids, and I'm living the Mormon dream and holiday now. Yeah. And I'm so busy with the kids that I'm not even able to see straight. I had my, from the oldest to the youngest, um, my, my oldest was not quite four when the youngest was born. So I just had three, boom, boom, boom. And this is just when I knew I am, I was not well suited to be a stay at home mom. This was, this was not something that I, it was something I really, really, really struggled with. Um, just my temperament and it, it was not well suited for what I was doing. Um, that's not the Mormon way. I know. It was really bad. I, I, even you, you and I would have grown up in the time where a mm-hmm. woman's place was in the home. Absolutely. Women shouldn't work outside the home. That 100%. is your whole purpose. That is your whole calling. 100%. There's no more noble calling than yep. to be a mom. Yep. So you would have had these voices of Ezra Tap Benson of doubt and shame yeah. 
why aren't, why aren't I loving this? Yep. Why is it not enough for me? Yep. Why do I want to do something else? What's yep. wrong with me? Again, mm-hmm. more self-doubt. All self-doubt. Oh, it no. always comes oh, back no, to self-doubt. Jenna, no. Always comes back to self-doubt. No. Yeah. So I am just feeling like why I, I lived, I lived for the kids' nap time and when they went to bed at night. And I would stay up late just to have some time for me. And then I would be just cranky in the morning, so not getting enough sleep. Um, and then marriage just got hard. Marriage got hard. Um, Rob and I both, you know, came from homes that were not great examples of, of emotional maturity. And we marriage struggled. always gets hard, by the way. It gets really <laughs> it always hard. Does. Always does. Yeah. Always. And it, 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 we did have our special challenges. It was really, really, really difficult. And it, I, I didn't notice it at the time. But looking back, I definitely was sliding into depression, periods of mild depression. Um, you know, the happiest day of my life was the day my, all my kids got into school and I'd have some time to myself. Always felt super selfish for having that feeling. Um, loved my kids, loved it, but it was not a, it was not an easy time for me in my life. And so as soon as I had a little space and the kids were in school, now I have time to work on the next problem. Always I'm the problem, but my next problem is I got to fix myself in my marriage. I've got to figure out what's going on between me and Rob and we've got to fix this. I'm going to fix it. I'm the fixer. Around what year is this? (sighs) So I'm going to say 2010-ish. Well, okay. Now we're up to 2010. Yeah, right. I don't know. All that right. whole All time, right. it's such a blur, John. It is a blur. Like it is. when you have little kids and I'm just serving yeah. in the church and doing, and I mean, just serving and calling after calling. And I, I loved working with the young women. I, there was so much I loved about that time and loved that word. Um, socially, it was hard for me. Socially, it's always been hard for me. It's been hard for me to be a Mormon socially. (laughs) Um, A lot of like wanting to keep up with the Joneses kind of feel within myself. Um, Even the friends that I had, I never could really feel like they were really my friends. Um, It's a lot on me. I just, I just never felt like I meshed. Like the things that people wanted to talk about were not the things I was interested in talking about. I've always kind of wanted to have the deeper conversations um, so I don't know. Things were just still kind of a, a mismatch in my life. Right. And you're going to fix your marriage. And I'm going to fix my marriage. I'm going to figure it out. So I started finding retreats and I started finding books and, and, you know, I found Oprah's super soul Sunday, yes. which I just started listening to all the people on Oprah's super soul Sunday. And I just remember, I I actually found some really good groups. I found like support groups. I found um, support groups for marriage. um, And I found some that were actually not put on uh, or sponsored by our faith. They were sponsored by evangelicals and other things. And I remember meeting these other women and I remember seeing how they would call on their faith. I remember seeing how they pray. I remember seeing how they'd invite everyone to pray with them. And I remember feeling like these guys have so much more of the spirit than I do. What is going on? Mm. Uh Oh, yeah. That could be dangerous to a faith. Oh yeah. (laughs) This was kind of like the start of this. I started saying, what is going on? And then I'd have these other Mormon women who were being told by things by their bishops on how to fix their marriages that were horrific that I just felt like, were terrible. And I remember just slowly, slowly, slowly over that period of time from like 2010 to 2013, I just remember more and more creeping into my consciousness of, okay, when I listened to Eckhart Tolle and Brene Brown, and um, this is where I found Richard Rohr was on uh, Super Soul Sunday. I remember thinking, these people have something really um, healing and really applicable to my life. And like, I actually have skills that I can use in my marriage and with myself and slowly I'm listening to general conference and it's sounding like 
it's not holding that same kind of feeling for me. And at times when they would talk about marriage or talk about other things, I was starting to think, this is really not good advice. What is wrong with us? Like, we're really good at, I started framing it in my mind, like, we're so good at third world problems and helping with people. And we suck at first world, like, interrelational problems. This is what started cropping up for me as I started educating myself more on. I was like first half of life and second half of life. A <laughs> little bit. <laughs> That's a Richard Rohr pre <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just started being like, things just started to feel off for me and it was, but it was really subtle. Um, I never really let myself cognitively go there. Um, and, uh, oh, I do want to mention one thing. I missed a really big part of this, this story, which is that probably back in 2004-ish, uh, my nephew left the church. My nephew I was very, very close to because my sister, who's nine years older than me, um, you know, had him at 21 or something. And so I was, so he was only 12 years younger. He's 12 years younger than I am. And he was my little buddy. I babysat him all, you know, when he was a baby, spent lots of time with him. It's very, very close to this particular nephew. And he's, he was always a super straight arrow and was doing all the things and just started having huge questions when he hit BYU and wasn't sure he was going to go on a mission, decided to go on a mission. And then ran into an, uh, an investigator who handed him a bunch of information and it blew his mind. And, um, while he was on his mission, he, his mission president actually gave him permission to have conversations with me. I would have conversations on the phone with him try cause I'm trying to keep him in the mm. faith. So during that time, I learned all, all the stuff, all the things. Um, it's interesting because I think just growing up, my mom must have like, read things along the way and known things like I knew about Joseph's polygamy. I knew about seer stones. I knew about things already growing up, but whatever I didn't know, I found out during that time. Wow. And I took a hardcore, I went straight to fair Mormon and I took a hardcore apologist stance. So I had all the answers for my nephew and I was just astounded when none of that worked. And he came home from his mission and, (laughs) and went and lived his life. Um, But uh, anyway, I think that's important. I think it's important to my story because I knew all the things. I knew all the historical problems and I had a pat answer for all of it. Um, And I remember a conversation with my nephew that I look back and I'm like, I must have frustrated you so much talking about the book of Abraham. (laughs) I remember him saying like all this evidence, this mountain of evidence on the book of Abraham. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, I was never one to deny evidence, but I was like, well, if you take a Venn diagram of like all of that and like maybe the way that the church can like explain it, even if there's like a 1% chance that the church's explanation is right, I'm going with that because look at my life. It works for me. This is what I believe. I'm not going to throw it away because a preponderance of the evidence tells me I should throw it away. So this is just where my mind was. So anyway, I'm just living proof that telling people all the things when they're not ready to go there works does not work at all. (laughs) It does work temporarily. Well, I mean, telling me all those things didn't shake my faith. Is what was my point. Okay. Sorry. I misheard you. Yeah. It did not shake my faith at all. Okay. If you're not ready to hear it and go there, it is not going to necessarily shake your faith to hear everything about the book of Abraham. What I thought you were That's saying is, is when an apologetic group yeah. provides random answers. Oh, it totally works. It's Yeah, it's not the substance of the answer Absolutely. so much as that there are that there's something. seemingly smart people that seem to have answers. Yes. And that works. And if there's an <laughs> option at all, however infinitesimal, <laughs> then you go with that. Yeah, right? that's what Fair Mormon is. It is. And yeah. I, I was so grateful for them at the time. Like, oh, they've heard of that. They know what blood atonement is. Let's chat about that, you know. So, so Fair gave you all the answers. Fair gave me all the answers. I had all the answers and I'm good. And I just know so much. <laughs> yeah. I was 
I was I was this faithful girl bringing up the hat and the stone like way back when, and people were like, "What?" And I'm like, "No, really. Apparently, there was a hat and a stone, you know." But, but totally, no problem. no problem, no problem at all. <laughs> so, um, so go back to that time when I'm I'm. Um, I'm starting to notice things and I'm noticing the evangelicals and they are so much more full of the spirit than I am. (laughs) And, and it really did start to eat at me. Like what is the gift of the Holy ghost? I don't even understand this. What does this even mean? Cause these people seem to have a lot more of a gift than I do. Cause I still, I still have not gotten these spiritual experiences. I really have not had them. I mean, I, I, I prayed about who to marry. I prayed about moving to California. I prayed about which school to go to, Utah or BYU. I never got answers. Mm-hmm. Never. Never. But that made sense to me because I was never good enough for what the answer. Mary Rob? Did you pray to Mary Rob? Oh, yeah. And? Nothing. Oh. Nothing. <laughs> so I just thought, well, God must just trust me, and I've just got to trust him that if I'm heading into fire, that he'll knock me out of the way. That Like, I didn't have any other way to frame it because it just didn't happen. But So once you see all these um, spiritual non-Mormons. Yeah, I'm like, what is happening here? Okay. These These people are like, they got it going on. This is amazing. And I just have to say... Margie and I had lost our faith by this point, but yeah. we were very much in the sort of Eckhart Tolle, yeah. A New Earth, yeah. Brene Brown, yeah. Super Soul Sunday. We were we were faith. We were no longer believers in Mormonism, yeah. or in an Orthodox way, yeah. But we were very active in Mormonism, yeah. And we were not getting spiritually fed by Mormonism, but we would watch Super Soul Sunday with our kids as our family home evening. Mm. And that was our source of spirituality. So I'm Love tracking, that. Margie and I are tracking yeah. along with you. Yeah. We just happen to be kind of non-literal believers yeah. doing the progressive, you know, yeah. thing while, while you're still. And I'm still a full, believer. full okay. literal so believer. Are, I'm, 100%. I'm, I'm tracking yep. parallel where Margie and I are. Is this mm-hmm. happening to you? Just so I can make sense. Yeah. Okay. And so those 2010 to 2013. 2010 to thir- 2013. I'm just, I'm leaning into this, all of this new stuff and my mind is being blown and I'm, I'm loving all of it. And I'm, and I'm getting more and more angry with some of the things that, that are happening in the church. And I remember mentioning it in one of my support groups and this evangelical woman gave me this book, told me to read this book called the furious longing of God by Brennan Manning. And that book was paradigm shifting for me. How so? Um, this God in this book loves you so, so, so much. It's called the furious longing of God. Like what would it do for your life if you understood how deeply God loved you? And this guy had been a, a pastor and he'd also been like homeless and, and breaking every commandment and talking about how God was with him, even when he was living under a viaduct, when he was doing horrible things, and when he was also a pastor. Yeah, given your story, you're going to resonate with that. I was like, you can you can have God with you? Like when you're not perfect? What is happening? I don't understand this. <laughs> you know? And I, But I just remember thinking there was such a hope. There was such a flood of like, this makes sense to me. That this is that I've been mistaken this whole time, and what if this is who God is? It opened up something for me. Mm. Are you getting emotional? Right now? Yeah, Why? because who? What? What could? What could that have done for my life? Knowing that God loved me for my whole life. You didn't ever. You never somehow felt that. No, I was never worthy of it. Okay, I don't want to disrupt your feelings. Yeah. but like I'm a child of God. He has sent me here. Has given me. Parents kind of dear. He loves me. Like the the whole Mormon primary experience is wrapped around God loving us and we're children of God and God's a loving heavenly father. How did that not seep through? Um, that's a very good question. I would focus on, this is what I do. I scan the thing and I focus on the one line before it grows too late. <laughs> it's a great song, but it's before it grows too late. Right? Oh. Like it, there's, there's always the message of if, if, you're this, then, if then. Conditional. Conditional, all conditional. And it's the kind of love that I felt growing up in my home. 
I, I don't, looking back, I don't believe my parents' love was conditional, but I felt that because of my mom's perfectionism. So it made sense to me that that's what love was. Love was conditional. And this was the first time I'd ever let it into my heart that maybe it wasn't. Maybe there was some sort of source of unconditional love. And maybe, just maybe, I was okay. And and that's got to be paradigm shifting, learning that outside your faith. Because you're like, wait a minute. why? Am, wh- number one, why am I not learning this in my faith? Yep. And number two, why is my one true faith not teaching this stuff? Yep. Right. Those are two Absolutely. separate things. It's like, and then I start having conversations with my sister where I'm like this book, like God's love is unconditional. And she's going, well, yeah. I'm like, no, we teach a conditionally loving God. That's the God I know. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. God's love is completely unconditional. Like yeah. we, we grew up in the same home. Yeah. Different people, different people, get like the different messages. She got, she got that yeah. message loud and clear. Yeah. I did not. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Same church, same home. Yeah. And so, um, I, so then I, I hit a summer, um, this is probably, I I think the first time I let myself say out loud, something's wrong here was right at the beginning of 2014. And I remember telling one of my really close friends, like, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm really feeling like the leaders of our church are missing something. Because I'm finding some of these things other places that are resonating with me more. And I don't understand this. Mm. And she was great. She was really affirming and just like, yeah, that can be really hard. And I don't think they all have it all figured out and, you know, whatever. But still, you know, super believing. Is Rob getting nervous at this point yet? Not yet. Does he even know? <laughs> no, okay. not really. You're going in your own. I'm kind of doing my own thing. You're going on your own spiritual journey, and mm-hmm. you're not necessarily really bringing not, him along with you. No, I'm not really telling anybody. Mm. And then things kind of came to a head that summer, the summer of 2014. Um, I had fallen into kind of one of my really, I would say, depressive states where it's summer, so I don't have to get the kids to school. It's all I can do to just even want to get up and feed them and take care of them. Um, I'm just not happy as a stay at home mom. Um, I've got a lot of guilt. I've got a lot of stuff going on and guilt yeah, just always mom, still. You know, yeah. Guilt. The mom guilt and the, I'm, I'm, I'm not reading my scriptures enough. I'm not praying enough. I'm not, I've still never gotten that Moroni 10, four experience. I must not be good enough. I'm probably not doing a very good job of my callings. Nothing's ever quite up to snuff. My kids aren't the perfect little Mormon kids sitting in the pews. Like my kids are hard <laughs> and it's a reflection of me and you know, just everything is hard. And so I just remember being really, really sad. And I just remember pleading to God to just let me know that he's there. Just let me know that this is real. And I remember having a conversation with one of my sisters who honestly is just one of those people that God talks to 24 seven. She's just like, she's got him on the red line to God. And she's taught, I mean, She's just so faithful and has always had such a deep connection to God. And I'm like, I don't get it. I don't, I don't have that. I don't have that. And I just remember having this conversation that I, it kind of broke me. So my sister is a very loving person and she wanted to help me. And for me, all I took in was there's no good answer for this. God wouldn't do this to me. So it must be me. And it was, it, it, the message came to me so loudly that this must be me. And I remember hanging up the phone and just, I lost it. I just lost it. I, and I literally, I, I just saw my entire shelf crash before my eyes. How so? I just hit this point cognitively. I said to myself, that was the first time I'd ever let it sink in. What if none of this is true? Like none of it with the church. Why'd you ask that? I think because I 
started to question if God was even real. Like I've been, I, I hit this point where I felt like my sister is so spiritual and kind and smart and I'm, I'm going to her with all of these questions and none of the answers to me in that moment felt satisfying. And I thought, I remember thinking to myself, if this is the best we've got, maybe we don't have it. Maybe we don't have it. Because if my sister can't find an answer for me in this, I don't know if anyone can. So maybe it's all crap. Mm -hmm. How do I know it's not crap? I remember just having that, that distinct feeling of myself. How do I personally know this is not crap? I've never had anything to tell me. I've always just gone on, do it enough and it'll, it'll happen. And it's never happened for me. So how do I personally know? I know nothing. I don't even know if God's there. I don't know if this is just a story that everybody's been telling me my entire life. And it's like, it did not occur to me until that moment. And it came to me in a moment and I was shattered. I don't know if I've ever cried so hard. It just, I lost it. And I literally, at that moment, I remember thinking, I'm going back to square one. I literally believe nothing until I truly in my heart believe it. I took everything in my truth basket and tossed it out in a moment. That's intense. It was intense. Hmm. It was super intense. And I, about that. <laughs> I feel like I must have. Uh -oh. I have no recollection. Like no. <laughs> I may not have. I don't know. I was honestly, it was so emotionally like taxing during that time. I don't have a clear memory of what happened. I remember I must have mentioned it to Rob, like I'm really struggling with this. And I just remember him kind of like. Oh, okay. He was, he was, he was, um, really quiet about it. Didn't tell me how he felt about it much. He didn't get angry or threatening with it or anything. He would just kind of took it in and was like, okay, this is happening. Okay. I don't know what this is. Um, and I remember at some point in the next following months, my, uh, my temple recommend was coming due and I didn't know what to do. And I went in and talked to the Bishop and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm having this experience. I don't know what I believe anymore. And I don't know what to do about that. But I still want to go to the temple. And I just remember, I remember telling him a few things that had been hard for me. Um, I remember giving him examples like, you know, I'd, I was primary pianist at the time. And, and I remember the chorister had been teaching one particular song to the kids and she was trying to get the meaning through to them, not just teach them the words, but she was like, now say if, and then with all of these sentences. And one of them was, if you keep his commandments, then his love will abound mm. when with her putting the, if then in there <laughs> and I lost it. And I'm like, I, I want out of my calling. I, I can't just sit there and listen to this stuff in primary. This is too much for me. And I don't know what to do with my temple recommend. And I just remember him saying, well, you know, I don't really get upset by these things because, you know, people have their own ways of doing things and I don't let it offend me. And I just remember saying to him, you know what? I, I feel like, I don't, I don't feel like it's wrong for me to feel offended by a message of God's conditional love. I don't feel like that's bad for me to feel offended by that. I think the spirit was offended and I was offended because it's not true. And it's a damaging message that's been damaging to me. Uh -oh. So I know. And I think I, he was a really nice guy, but I don't think he had any clue yeah, what yeah. to do with me. And he yeah. was just like, well, I'm going to be released in like six months. So kind of <laughs> let me know what you decide. <laughs> and it was kind of left with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I instead decided to go to his counselor to get a recommend. I just kind of went to the other guy when he was signing them. <laughs> and I just, I told him the same thing. I'm like, I don't know what to believe. He's like, well, do you believe there's a God? Do you believe he loves you? I said, well, I want to, if there's a God, I do believe he loves me. 
And he's like, okay, well then just, you know, say yes to everything and God knows what you mean. I'm like, awesome. That's great. And then I go to the guy in the stake presidency and I told him the same thing. I don't know what to believe, but I kind of, I want to stay going to the temple. I want to figure this out. And he's like, okay, do you feel worthy to go? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right. And he signed it. He didn't even ask me any of the questions. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but th those were the only people that I even mentioned it to. I didn't mention it to family other than, you know, what I'd already talked to my sister about. I kind of stopped talking to people about it. That was really painful for me to not be able to have anyone really have answers for me or, you know, be able to talk to me about it. So I just kind of kept up to myself and went to church and felt like I was the only person having these questions sitting in the pews. Yeah, I'm kind of, I don't want to make too big a deal of this, but like I, I, I have to say I'm struck by the fact that you're having this for you earth shattering loss of faith crisis yeah. of faith and you're not really talking to rob about it mm -hmm. and you know that's fine i mean i mm -hmm. but i just that's a thing like what is it about marriage or mormonism or just mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. outside of you know where you're married mm -hmm. but you're kind of just living parallel lives sometimes or yeah. not really always sharing emotional intimacy mm -hmm. and, and I'm mm -hmm. not saying your marriage. Mm -hmm. I'm saying mm -hmm. every marriage, all no. our marriages, yeah. like, we how fall in the into world that does it sure. happen that this is your supposed soulmate. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is the most important person supposedly in your life. Yeah. And you're going through the hardest thing. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in my case, it was very different. I went to Margie mm -hmm. worried, mm -hmm. but then she met me there and mm -hmm. we were able to go through this together. Yeah. It's it, it, it would be, I imagine for me, it would have been a very lonely, mm -hmm. hard thing to mm -hmm. not be able to kind of talk to my spouse about it and get them on the same page yeah. and then go through this together so that you're yeah. always kind of in sync. Yeah. But, but I imagine there's, I mean, for many, there's fear. Will they leave me? Will they still love me? Mm -hmm. Will it be disruptive? Will I hurt their faith? Mm -hmm. Was, or, or there's just, you're not necessarily connected in that yeah. way, or that's not how your relationship is. How was it yeah. for you? For us, we were not terribly connected spiritually. You know, we, we didn't do a lot of the stuff. I always struggled. I always struggled in my marriage from the start. I always struggled to like pray with other people or to like, we did that for a while when we were first married. I always felt like I should be doing that. Companionship. But I, I, yeah. But I was always really uncomfortable with it. And I, I was super uncomfortable with it. And I thought something was wrong with me there too. It's always yeah. what's wrong with me. And, but I would shrug it off and I would like find, I would never be the one to say, Hey, let's do this. You know? And I think he got kind of sick of being the one saying, should we do this? And he can kind of tell, I don't want to do it. And I don't want to be the, the voice very often. And, and again, this is feeding this thing of I'm not spiritual. I'm not spiritual. There's something wrong with me. Right. So I, it was always hard for me. Mm. I, I wanted to do scripture study with my kids, but the last thing I wanted to do was lasso those three kids <laughs> with such high energy and no one's listening and no one cares. And, you know, I'm just noticing how much like trying to get the family together for family prayer is just making everybody miserable. And I just, I just remember taking a step back and going, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? This is before my shelf crash. Like, why are we doing this? I don't even understand why we're doing this. What is this doing? Mm -hmm. Like I'd be all on board if it meant something, but I feel like this doesn't even mean anything what we're doing. So we were always kind of disconnected in that. And I think both of us have this really sense of duty. So we never felt great about that. Rob was always more of a willing soul, but he didn't want to feel like he was forcing me. And I had kind of a rebellious attitude about it. Kind of like, oh, I just don't like this. Mm -hmm. I don't like this. So, so it wasn't like this big shift of what was going on in our family when I'm having this and I'm going to church and I'm doing the things and I'm still getting my temple recommend and I'm, I'm willing to do all the stuff. So, but the other thing I was going to say is yeah. that, it, I don't know if you felt lonely, but yeah. I'm just trying to imagine like you're in the middle of holiday, Utah, yep. hyper Mormons everywhere. Yes. Thomas S. Monson's old house is right down the street. Yep. This is actually one of the wealthiest few stakes in the church, mm -hmm. the holiday Utah. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And, and I don't, I just can imagine it, what it might be like for you to have yeah. no one to talk to, mm -hmm. including Rob. 
Yeah. And then to be experiencing this in holiday. Absolutely. And, and yeah, feeling like such a fish out of water. And like you're just quiet at church. Yeah. What do you say at church? What do you say at church? Yeah. Like, yeah, I just was kind of going through the motions for that whole year. It lasted a whole year where I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything about it. And then one day on Facebook, I come across an article. Uh, it was actually written by Thomas Montgomery and it, Montgomery. It, yeah. Wendy Montgomery and Tom, oh, Tom Montgomery. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, and he referenced a podcast. It was Bill Reel's podcast. And I clicked on it and it was because it, it, it referenced losing trust in the church. And so I listened to that and I remember sitting in a parking lot listening to Bill Reel <laughs> and I just start crying because there's someone else in the church who's still at church and asking questions and having these conversations. And I like, I'm like, you're kidding me. I'm not alone. You're kidding me. There are other people like this. You've got to be kidding me. And this is during his faithful phase, right? Yeah. Where he was still, yep. had lost his faith, but he was trying to yeah. make it work, right? Yes. And you're this getting is, emotional. Yeah. Why are you getting emotional? Because I wasn't alone because it was so lonely for that year. It was so confusing. It was so like, what, what is wrong with me still? What is wrong with me? Um, and just feeling like, well, I've, I've got to just keep doing this. I've got to just keep the train going because I don't know what's happening. So I've just got to do this. But feeling really disconnected from my own spirituality, from my own life. Um, so, yeah, hearing, hearing Bill was like this breath of fresh air. And then I just was off into the Mormon podcast rabbit hole, found Mormon stories and found, um, found Mormon matters and a thoughtful faith and, and all of them just going from thing to thing, to thing, to thing. And hearing all of the historical stuff all over again, that was not new, but I was seeing it from a completely different corner of the room. So all the fair Mormon stuff is still in my mind, but I'm going, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> these are not, these answers are not as satisfying as I once felt they were. Um, we are not. And I think the thing that was the most disturbing for me was just the unwillingness to just see it, to see a problem for what it was and deal with it. Like I, I just started having a real aversion to um, any kind of an argument that said, well, we don't, it's not really what you think it is. You know, when you talk about the book of Abraham, let, that's like, I'm going to have my alternative facts over here. And those are the ones I'm going to believe in. That did not work for me anymore where it worked very well for me before <laughs> it made room for it. Now I was looking at it saying, now you've got to admit this is a problem. Like, can we just start from there? <laughs> can we start from there that this is not what we thought it was? Um, and so that was like, it, it kind of brought a new kind of energy to me in some ways. But during that same summer, it was probably a month after I found these podcasts. Um, we, my daughter experienced an injury at our house. My kids um, wasn't even sure how they got a hold of some bungee cords and um, they were fighting over a bungee cord and my son let go of one end and it re rebounded into my daughter's eye and um, super, super scary moment um, for a mom. Uh, you know, there was a possibility of her losing her eye permanent vision damage, which she does have some permanent vision damage, but it was just really disturbing, really hard. Home teachers come over, um, you know, at midnight when we get home from the hospital to give her a blessing. And I just remember thinking at the time, I have absolutely no idea if these blessings work, but I'm super grateful that they're here in case they do. And, you know, maybe my ward and their faith can do something for her because I don't think I I obviously can't do anything for her in this moment. I'm useless to my daughter in helping her heal from this if she's going to heal. And I remember going to the next day that they had a word fast for her. And I just remember how much love and outpouring I got from my word that had not always been the norm for me that I had felt. 
And I remember being overwhelmed by the goodness and the well wishes of the people around us and the people who were reaching out and doing things for us. <clears throat> and with like zero forethought, none, I got up in that testimony meeting and I got up behind the pulpit and I said, I'm so grateful to everybody. This has been a really hard thing that our family's facing with this injury. And I'm just noticing how good we are at rallying around people when we have an outward injury, when there's a death in the family, when there's some sort of acceptable thing that or tragic thing that has befallen you. And I'm also noticing that there are these deeper things that no one is talking about. Kind of like having problems with your faith. I've been experiencing that for a whole year all by myself. And I've never told anybody here because we don't talk about these things. And what I'm noticing right now is that I needed this kind of support all year long and it was never available to me. <laughs> this right now, what you've done for my family is what I've needed. And I just want to just say it out loud that there are people having marital problems. There are people having mental health problems. There are people having depression. There are people that are really struggling in so many ways and we are not telling each other. And so I've been sitting here alone in the pews for a year. And I just want anyone else here to know if you think you're the only one out there, I want you to know you are not alone. And I haven't gotten up to bear my testimony in a very long time because I don't have one. But I'll tell you what I do believe. I believe in goodness. I believe in, that love can heal. I believe in service, can lift us up. And I believe that the teachings of Jesus Christ are really good. And that's what I know. And I walked off. <laughs> And while it felt good to say, and I like felt like I like unburdened my truth, and I, I was super naive thinking like, wow, you know, people are people might really like that, that I got kind of vulnerable there. And I was completely unprepared for the cold shoulder that everyone what? No. with a few exceptions. And I was also unprepared for the people that came out of the woodwork that were like, yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, having, I'm in that same place. I'm in that same place. People I would have never dreamed were struggling with their testimonies reached out to me. Okay, around what year month was this? Do you remember? Summer of 2014. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. No, 2015. Okay. Yeah, because I, yeah, shelf crashed 14, okay. 2015, summer of 2015 okay. is when that hit me. So, um, so then I was out, I was out. I remember having a discussion. We had a new Bishop at that point. I remember talking to him. I remember telling him that my biggest fear is that I was going to be marginalized, that I was never going to be given a calling again, that, you know, that I'd said this to everybody and now no one's going to want me to be, you know, part of anything. And he promptly called me as a relief society teacher and basically he, he, they, he said, we're having a new shift in Relief Society presidency, but I've got something for you. I'll let you know. And that's what it turned out to be. So it wasn't something that was chosen by the Relief Society president. I was foisted on the Relief Society president by my bishop. Um, and I say foisted because I, I don't think it was a terribly comfortable match <laughs> for the two of us. But, really quickly, yeah. I... Uh, as I'm thinking about this, like whenever you're hiding and alone yeah. and suffering in silence yeah. and you, you pack it down and you pack it down yeah. and you, you try and just journey on and white knuckle it, it always comes out. It's always yeah. going to, it's going to come out yep. as an explosion yep. at some point. Absolutely. That's the way humans work. Absolutely. And so it happened for you. Like the ward is rallied around your family. Your daughter's injured. This is your moment to just thank the ward and yeah. go back into your Mormon bubble. Yeah. But because the pressure has been building up so high, you use this moment where the words yeah. really finally showed up for you yes. to dump all this on them. Yes. But but that's what happens when you hold things in. Totally. 
So, so and I don't recommend it. Just let it be clear. <laughs> I do not recommend that you do this to anyone out there. Be yeah. much more mindful about that than I was. I was very foolhardy. But it sounds like your bishop didn't like make you feel awful no. or try and punish you no. or make you a project. He gave you a calling. He gave me a calling. And mm -hmm. and then I'm just repeating, but mm -hmm. you lost you kind of lost some thin relationships, but maybe started making some associations that that maybe turned out to be a little bit deeper than what the the, the normal relationship might have been. A hundred percent. Okay. A hundred percent. I was kind of stunned by that. Like people I had never really been friends with in the word. I I was able to go deep with some of these people and to recognize that for some of them, they've been, they've been feeling like this for a very long time. I remember just being shocked. Like all these people have been there and I had no idea. I had no idea. And everyone's so hush hush and everyone's in a, in a Sunday school class or relieves the site. No one's saying anything. No one's, you know, so, um, I've always been, uh, probably less worried than I should be about like rocking other people or whatever. So I, I did it all wrong from there on, like for a while in church. And I s for sure made a bunch of people super uncomfortable. What were you doing? I was teaching relief society and I was mentioning that I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. I was actually letting You're people know I was being, being I was being yeah. vulnerable yeah. and I was teaching lessons in a way that you know, I mean, honestly, every time I taught a lesson, it was a struggle. It was a struggle to teach because I am not someone that can just teach something I don't believe in. I can't do it. Um, so I remember getting lessons and going, there's absolutely no way I can teach this. But then I'd sit on it and I'd sit on it and I'd sit on it and I'd always find an angle. I'd always find a way to broaden the conversation. But I know that that made a lot of people uncomfortable. I remember having a conversation with the Relief Society presidency and I'm like, if I'm ever pushing it too far, will you let me know? And all of them like did not skip a beat and said, oh, you're making people uncomfortable. I mean, they weren't coming to me and say it. It's this passive aggressive like kind of tone because we're so nice as Mormons. They don't want to rock the boat with me, but they're sitting there like sweating bullets when I'm teaching. And at the same time, you know, cause they were saying, oh yeah, we've had people come to us like complaining about mm. some of the way I'm teaching and what I'm doing. And at the same time, I'm getting texts from people going, thank you. Thank you for saying it. Please. This is the best. I love it when you teach. Like mm. I, I just, I would have a, a, a litany of those, but what the, what the release study president is getting is all of the, she's making us uncomfortable. I remember after one particular lesson, this cute little old lady on my word comes up to me and pats me on my hand. And as she's on her way out, she's like, you're always making us think, <laughs> you know, cause I was definitely teaching in non-traditional kind of ways. So were you like sharing the controversial history? Mm -mm. None of that. None of that. Okay. But what I was doing was, um, in a missionary lesson, I would talk about, maybe our neighbors don't like us because we think we're better than them. And so maybe we ought to just talk about the elephant in the room and say, maybe we need to get off our high horse and see what we can learn from them. And maybe they would actually feel the gospel more from us if we were interested in them in that way. Because I, I actually got a neighbor who's not part of our faith. And I went on a walk with her and I said, what bugs you about us? And then I gave a lesson based on that. Or, um, when it was, when it was about self-reliance, I'm like, well, look at the ways that self-reliance can make us super selfish. Like what about King Benjamin? What about these messages of don't judge people? Like we got to be careful with our ideas of self-reliance, you know, I, stuff like that. I was just rocking the boat. So have you seen the movie <clears throat> Pleasantville? I haven't, but I, I know the gist. Okay. Yeah. The, the, this is, this is what it's reminding me of. So in the okay. movie Pleasantville, it starts out, it's all black and white. Yeah. It's like a fifties kind of vibe mm -hmm. and everybody's kind of living this beaver cleaver, yeah. uh, you know, father knows best kind of fifties, mm -hmm. uh, suburban life. Yeah. And then all of a sudden one of the characters, uh, has this shattering experience and, and, be, and turns color. And nobody like can name it. It's just like that person's different all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And so this person's operating in a multicolored, with a multicolored perspective 
in the midst of all these other people that are still operating in a black and white perspective. Yeah. yeah. And everybody's uncomfortable, but no one quite knows why. Yeah. But this person is like seeing new colors, new dimensions, trying to get other people to see and get excited mm -hmm. while everybody else is like uncomfortable. And it, it's reminding me you're having kind of this Pleasantville awakening, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of this Richard Rohr second half of life experience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would even say kind of a, a Christian rebirth. You've been born again mm -hmm. and you're trying to, trying to, I don't know if you're trying to wake up everyone around you, but mm -hmm. you're, you're definitely trying to discuss the types of issues mm -hmm that you think kind of are about next level gospel living. Yeah. And there's some people that are like going, well, this is cool and interesting. And then there's a bunch of other people that are just like, who is this woman mm -hmm. and why is she making us feel uncomfortable? Cause yes. the, cause for so many people, it's like all is well in Zion, the gospel mm -hmm. just like fit in your role and everything's great. And just teach the lesson. And it's more of a ritual than it is a mm -hmm. school, Sunday yeah. school or church mm -hmm. and your job is to just fit in the role and make mm -hmm. everyone feel comfortable yeah. and not to rock the boat. Yeah. And you're kind of being Jana Spengler rocking the boat a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Making people uncomfortable, challenging yeah. them. Yeah. Questioning things. Yeah. That's a, I just have to say, that's a very different thing than kind of the normal, like have a faith crisis because you mm -hmm. learned about peep stones. Right. And then you want to talk about historical problems and everyone's uncomfortable. And so yep. you leave. Yeah. This is a very different journey than kind of the average journey on Mormon yeah. stories. Yeah. And, and what I was kind of doing that stuff just under the radar, like I'd be sitting next to Rob in and it, cause I'm doing all the historical studies now and I, I am having all the problems with it, but I've got Rob sitting next to me in Sunday school. And he, at one point he said, sitting next to you in these classes is kind of like I'm back on my mission in Japan and I've got a, an investigator there and you're just praying that no one says anything weird. <laughs> like that is how I feel. Like, he just doesn't want anyone to say anything controversial because he doesn't know what it'll do to me. So I, I would, it was kind of the kind of thing where someone would say something and I'd just lean over to him and kind of whisper and go, yeah, that didn't happen. Just so you know, or that's way more complicated than you think. I was, so Rob was getting an earful and I'm sure the poor guy, but he would know when, when things got uh, really bad for me. Like if I was su really super triggered, I would just sit there and he could tell it's bad because she's gone silent. And he would always kind of raise his hand and say something kind of diplomatic that would acknowledge he's, he's really actually very good at this. Just kind of acknowledge what I'm feeling. Um, but in a, in a, in still a very acceptable way that's acceptable to the room. So he's, he's always been kind of good with, with that. He's been very respectful through all of this with everything I was going through. He's kind but. of a go with the flow duty kind of guy. Yeah. I get the sense. Loyal. He is. Absolutely. hundred percent. Low key. Yep. For sure. Supportive. Mm -hmm. He is. It's um, not bad. No. You could have worse. Way worse. For sure. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and all of the other stuff in our marriage, like honestly, I, our, me differentiating my faith has one of, been a, one of our lesser issues, you know, mm -hmm. compared to just other things we've dealt with. And yeah. so I don't know. He's, he's been great. The biggest gift that Rob has given me through all of this is that even when he doesn't agree with me, and that's a lot, he has given me the dignity of just saying, I can see that this is a sincere journey for you. And I can understand why that would be problematic for you. And even just that, just letting me talk and just saying like, yeah, that sounds super hard. That makes sense why that would be a problem. But for him, it just still comes back to, but no, this is, this is, I believe this, this is like my spiritual home and I have had spiritual experiences and sure he's got a lot more nuance in him now because of me, but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, he's, we've been able to manage some of those, not that it has, hasn't had its problems, but yeah. anyway, but yeah, um, so kind of fun during this time period, I found, so I, after about nine months of this, I started feeling like, okay, I can, I have people that I can listen to on the internet, but I need people I can talk to. I need people to process this whole experience with, and I got to figure out where to find the people, but the like people who had totally left the church those angry post Mormons were super like scary to me. 
that's not a vibe I want. So I've, uh, holding all kinds of judgment. I've always held all kinds of judgment for people not doing it my way, right? <clears throat> um, I was holding all kinds of judgment for uh, the ordained women movement. And still, even though I'm having all of these feelings, I'm still having holding my judgments. But I, I turned to a neighbor who I knew was just a super open-minded person. And I had heard that her ward had done a fifth Sunday on doubt. So I called her and said, who, who in your ward, like who put that on? Who was talking about it? Who, who do I talk to? And in that conversation, she, she did connect me with some great people in my stake. And she also said, well, do you want to meet Maxine Hanks? And, and I, I, I said, who's that? <laughs> Never heard the name. Um, of course, I'd heard of the September 6th. But um, anyway, she was friends with her and she's like, yeah, do you want to, do you want to meet her? She's, she was, um, she's part of the September 6th and she's been rebaptized in 2012. And I'm like, um, yes, that's who I want to talk to. I want to talk to this person, please. Thank you. And, um, and had the super for just the, the it's, it's so fortunate to, to sit down and meet with Maxine. And we were like fast friends having these deep conversations from the minute we met. And Is she in our stake? Um, no, she's not. Um, she just knew, uh, knew my neighbor through interfaith councils and some things that they were both involved in. And, um, and within the same month I had, you know, Thomas McConkey had come out with his navigating Mormon faith crisis. And I had, I had read that and it had really resonated for me. And one of my other neighbors that I played tennis with said, Oh, you mentioned that book to me. Um, his mom's in our book club and we're going to be reading it. And I, and he's going to come and talk to us. And I invited myself to their book club and said, can I come? Can I be there? Um, and so had the fortune to meet Thomas McConkie as well. And, um, and just really started forging conversation with them, both of them. And, um, you know, I remember asking Tom Thomas, like, where's, where are the people? Where's the group of people? And he said, well, we should create something. You want to create something, you know? So, um, through, through that, he, he, he started holding some meetings, some monthly meetings, um, in his relative's house. And, um, and I, I was kind of helping support that through the summer kind of monthly, and then through that, I met um, like Jay Griffith, who runs the Faith Again group, and started kind of connecting with that group. And um, I remember the first Faith Again meeting I went to, they had Richard Bushman. That was the one that was recorded where Richard Bushman said his famous, you know, f famous in these circles phrase of he, when he said that the dominant narrative wasn't true. So if you watch that video... I'm in that video on the, off to the side. And I, and I asked the question, like, how, how do I go about being a Relief Society teacher and teach authentically without scaring everybody in the room? Cause I'm cog I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that that's not why people are coming to church is to be freaked out by me. Right. And he, I remember he gave one of those brilliant answers ever. <laughs> he said, it's like teaching your kids about sex. If you're nervous, they're nervous. And I remember that that was a huge lesson for me, actually. It's become a life lesson for me, but it was a huge lesson for me in how I engage at church because I noticed how much nervous energy I was holding through the way I was teaching. I think I became a better teacher after that um, because there's, I, there's just so much self-doubt going through you when you are differentiated from the group that you're with. Like I could, I was not comfortable in my skin. I was trying so hard. I wanted everyone to just accept me and understand me. And it's a really hard truth to start to get used to that people, a certain segment are never going to understand you. And that's okay. Um, but that was really super helpful advice, really super helpful advice to me. Um, but meeting the, meeting up with some of these people and meeting some of these groups and understanding um, how they were doing things was so, so helpful. That, that summer, 2016, was the first time I attended Sunstone. Um, I felt kind of naughty, 
walking in the doors. I felt like I was doing something wrong. These were those like intellectuals that got themselves in trouble. And like, that's the, the idea I had of Sunstone growing up, you know, they were kind of suspect. Um, but I just remember that first Sunstone, like I was there from sunup to sundown every single day, taking in every single class, you know, and just, it, it honestly awakened something in me to say, there are spaces where we can be honest. There are spaces where we can just let it all out. I can actually voice what is actually going on with me and people are not going to shut me down. They are actually going to want to have a conversation about that. Met two amazing women there in one of the classes and who remain friends of mine to this day. Um, the second day, one of them brought me Falling Upward um, by Richard Rohr. And I remember when she handed me this book, she's like, you need this book. And I remember thinking to myself, this is that guy I saw on Oprah last year. And I remember watching that first interview with Richard Rohr where I thought, oh, this guy's nice. He's great, whatever. And then the last 10 minutes of this interview he did with her, I was like jaw on the floor because he was speaking so directly to my experience. And the oh, thing, so. so the thing I loved about him, one of the things he said, I remember him saying is religion is the best thing in the world and religion is the worst thing in the world. And I remember Oprah had a, a, a reaction to that, like you're out of the cloth. You're not supposed to be saying this. And he was like, well, it's true. You know, there's a lot that's wrong with it. And it, there was just something so refreshing to me about hearing someone say that who was part of religion. And hearing him say, look, our egos get involved in religion. Our egos get involved. One of the things I remember him saying is, our egos want us to be separate and superior. This is part of its function. What a perfect place to have that thrive is in religion. It gives you the perfect opportunity to feel separate and superior. Imagine why that resonated with me <laughs> with Mormonism. I'm like, oh my gosh, you tell people that this is the truth, you have it. Of course, that is an ego. Like, that's good for our egos. That feels really, really good, right? Um, and then he, he, I remember him saying this phrase, who knew religion is the perfect place to hide from God? Like, what is that to do that from our egos? It is the perfect place to hide from God. And I just remember, like, I kept that, that interview on my DVR for a year. <laughs> and I'd go back and just listen to that and take that in. And the, and the other thing he said that really, really resonated, he said, if you start to notice the problems and the evils in religion— and you fight against it too directly and too hard for too long, you become the mirror image of what you hate. And I had started to see some of that in myself of the judgment that I was holding against those judgy people. I mean, the irony, right? Um, I, I started to notice how I was holding, now I was feeling separate and superior from those Mormons who aren't getting it the way I'm getting it. I started to notice those things in myself. And then the last thing he said is, if you want to get through this, your best bet is to see everything through a lens of love. So from that time forward, when I had things happen, like I, I did go to my Relief Society president at one point and asked for new um, visiting teachers because I had, they had just moved me away from someone that I felt could actually listen to me. So I said, can you actually put that back? Can you undo that? Because I'm having these questions. Well, immediately, one of her counselors brings me a Book of Mormon and puts it in my mailbox with these quotes from Spencer Kimball about when my faith is low, I need to read the Book of Mormon, you know, all of these things. And I remember at the time, my initial reaction being, I feel so misunderstood. They think that that's what I need is to read the Book of Mormon. They don't understand that every time I open the Book of Mormon, it throws me further into my faith crisis. They don't understand this being like really snippy about it in my heart. And then I stopped and thought, lens of love, lens of love, lens of love. <laughs> like this is a woman who cares deeply about me. She took the time to handwrite this huge thing for me and bring me this like 
what an act of service from that woman. And all I can think about is how she doesn't get me that that's really self-serving. So it helped me turn around things like that in my mind to see it differently. So I remember I, I was, I still wanted to connect to people. I still wanted to be instructive. So even with her, I went up to her and said, you know, um, I so appreciate what you did and bring me that Book of Mormon. And that's a hard message for me. I took some things from that that weren't easy. And you could tell she wasn't ready for the conversation. So I shut it down really quick and just said, you know what? I appreciate it. Thank you. And walked away. Because I still wanted those learning opportunities. I wanted to be understood. But I started getting to know when people were not ready to have that conversation with me. It wasn't going to go anywhere. So... So, so after Sunstone, I, um, I started looking more into Richard Rohr. I got this book. I started reading the book and I looked up his website and I saw this program that he has and being me, I never saw a, a retreat or, a, you know, a workshop or an experience or something that I didn't, didn't want to try to sign up for. Here's this two year living school program, had no idea what it was, but I knew that that, that Richard Rohr's message really resonated with me. So I'm like, I want to go, I need to go learn from this guy. I need to figure out what this is. And so I applied and put in my application that summer for the living school. Um, and it's a deal where you, they take interview or they take all of their applications once a year. And then, um, you find out six months later, whether you were accepted into the program and it starts a year later. And during that time, I, I went to my first Mormon matters retreat with Natasha, um, and Dan Butherspoon. And, um, what was that about? what was that? Tell our listeners what those, what are, those what are they were, yeah. such a great thing. So it was, I think it was the very first, uh, Mormon matters retreat they had done. Um, and I know it's patterned off after the ones that you and Natasha had been doing. Um, that it's, it's basically a retreat for people who are questioning and, um, they're wonderful. They, it was, it was, it was a life changing weekend for me. Um, just very cathartic. So we learn, um, learn a lot about what conversion is, what deconversion is, what vulnerability is, what uh, learn about relationships, learn about why this is hard to move through this. And it's with a small group of like 20 people. It's enough to like, it was enough to bond us together, hear each other's stories, recognize we're not the only ones going through this. Um, and then learning different things about framing faith differently. And, um, and uh, Marty Erickson was part of that uh, that retreat as well. Just really, and you know, these are three amazing people. And um, I just it 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 was so healing to be able to find all of these spaces all at once where I could be myself. I could be myself. I could be understood. I could actually say what was on my heart, and I no longer felt like I was alone. I never felt like no longer felt like I was crazy. And I started forging friendships that had a depth that matched, I think what my soul had always wanted, but never knew how to get to with anybody else. Um, before that, you know, in my relationships in the church and with other things. So you're kind of making me think about this time because this mm -hmm. was, this would have been after my excommunication, mm -hmm. but like I knew I was going to get excommunicated at some point, but mm -hmm. I had asked Dan Witherspoon to mm -hmm. start or take over Mormon Matters podcast because mm -hmm. he was down on his luck. I knew he was mm -hmm. brilliant and gifted. Yeah. And I knew I didn't want him to go like sweep floors at a bookstore. I wanted his talents to be utilized. So mm -hmm. I asked him to take over Mormon Matters podcast. Mm -hmm. He turned it into the podcast for being a faithful Mormon. Yep. And he did that for many years mm -hmm. under the Open Stories Foundation umbrella. Yeah. We always had a good working relationship. Then when Natasha and I started these faith crisis retreats, mm -hmm. um, there was always people that wouldn't come because I'd been excommunicated. And, right. and you know, Dan was looking for a way to kind of – hone his craft and and mm -hmm. be more of a support to people. And so Natasha would would do retreats with me for traditional mm -hmm. faith crisis stuff, but then she'd partner with Dan mm -hmm. and do these additional retreats for people that really wanted to stay in. Yep. 
And I, you know, it's been a couple of years, but Dan and I used to work really closely together mm -hmm. and, and there was always like Mormon stories or Mormon matters and mm -hmm. thoughtful faith. And which one are you? And mm -hmm. it was, uh, it's a, it's a time that's kind of gone, but at the time yeah. it was an important thing. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, it, it was really cool to see Dan and Natasha be able to make those happen. Yeah. And it was fun to get to know you as soon as you kind of, mm -hmm. and you started participating in those at one point. I did. But, but I did. all I was going to say is that this yeah. is an interesting time where the Open Stories Foundation was just really trying to support wherever you were in the spectrum. Yeah. We wanted to support you. And I, I still have that overall mission with the Mormon Stories mm -hmm. podcast, which mm -hmm. is why I'm interviewing you. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but at some point it just became too hard yeah. and Dan wanted to go do his own thing and yeah. that's fine. But yeah. it, I guess all the reason why I'm going into this monologue is just because like that was an era where, where for many, many years we were trying to really explicitly support people in any path. Yeah. And it's weird that in my world that mm -hmm. that kind of had to kind of go mm -hmm. away. Yeah. I'm sad, but now it's, it's it's less complex, which I like it's yeah. more simplified. And I think there's other people stepping in to try and fill that, that role. And I think yeah. Dan's still doing his thing, but yeah. I think what I'm really trying to say is, is for me, what's interesting is if you talk to Bushman or, or others, they'll say when someone loses their faith, we've pretty much lost them. Like mm -hmm. they don't have a high level of confidence that, that they can keep people in the church. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about your story is mm -hmm. you Somehow the formula was right where you were able to stay. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, it's fun and interesting to think that, mm -hmm. that Dan and Natasha and I a little bit, mm -hmm. we're all kind of part of that because I think if the church could bottle yeah. um, helping people stay, I think they would want to bottle that. Absolutely. And, and it sounds like you had some bishops that were decent. Yep. You had the right kind of formula. You had the right husband. And you found, you know, Thomas, M Thomas McConkie mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Mormon Matters and mm -hmm. Natasha and Dan. Yep. I guess I just, I guess I'm, this is a really long way of saying mm -hmm. there were a lot of resources that came together that made you feel like you could stay 100%. when there's a lot of other people that end up leaving. A hundred percent. How do you make sense of that? You know, this is something that I've been thinking about myself for so long, which, you know, I, I, I want to say up front, I do not believe it that my path is for everybody. I do not believe that you can set up a system in the church that is going to retain everybody. I don't think it's everybody's spiritual path. And I've gotten to a place as judgy as I was at one point about how everyone is doing this. I have come to a place where I honor the necessity of each person taking their path. And I recognize my own privilege in being able to do what I did. I was at a point in my life where I wasn't having to make des decisions about baptizing my kids or not. I was not in a place where I'm a man and I have to decide if I'm ordaining my child or not. I'm not, I was not in a place where my kids were getting married in the temple and I had to make decisions about that. Um, I, I, I did have bishops that made this okay for me to continue to participate. I have a temperament that allows me to be able to walk through this. I think honestly, having a hard childhood and not being very understood, it felt okay to me. You know, I think if you grew up in a more loving household, maybe it wouldn't work for you to walk through this fire because it's not fun. It's not fun to go to church and feel completely misunderstood. It, it can be soul crushing. There have been so many times when I'd come home from church and just cry and Rob would see that. And that's why he could connect to the, the sincerity of my journey. I didn't make it all about, you know, we've got to figure out if this is true or if this is not true. I, for me, for whatever reason, that has always kind of been a secondary thing. Like when I tossed out my truth cart, I tossed out knowing that the church was true. And now I'm just kind of like, I don't even know that I care. That's not my battle. So there are a lot of things, and, and there were a lot of these groups of people that could rally around me. I did forge really good friendships where I felt like I had places to be understood. 
And I found the living school that helped me have a bird's eye view of all of this to understand how deeply this is a human issue we are experiencing in a, in a Mormon flavor. Um, so anyway, I, I just always like to say that because there's so much pressure. There's so much pressure in families. There's so much pressure in marriages to make the faith crisis person, the person who is experiencing this, do it a certain way, right? It's like the pressure that uh, a bunch of LGBT people felt when Tom Christofferson's book came out, that a book that is, was, I think, with the, had every intent of like, let's open up understanding and love for our for our LGBT brothers and sisters and children and, and gain acceptance for them, but can be weaponized by parents who are like, look, he did this and so can you, right? I'm so sensitive to people like me, our stories being used as a weapon against people going through faith crisis who it is not in their best interest to stay connected to the church. So I, I just really want to say that, that yeah, special, special circumstances have made that be okay for me for now. And that's about all I can say about that <laughs> because um, all I can speak to in this story is my personal story. So when I work with clients, I come in with zero idea of what they should be doing because the truth is they know it. The, the map is written in their own souls. And I, I just see my job as helping people find out what that is for them. But it's taking me a long time to get there, you know, and, I, I, and, and this might be a, a, a good place to just um, talk to so touch on what opened up for me during this time period of, of this kind of soul searching and getting connected with some of these people, it is the time when I started to, um, to open my mind to some of the social issues and things like that, that I had been completely oblivious to before this, like the, the patriarchy thing. I, I remember, um, listening to a podcast with some of the board members of ordained women and it wasn't, it's kind of at that time, I'd kind of had a shelf crash, but I still felt naughty for listening to it. I've always felt naughty doing all these things, going to Sunstone, listening to these podcasts. It was like kind of hush hush. I didn't want anyone to see me doing it. Um, but I remember listening to these women and I remember it's a similar time. I listened to Kate Kelly's uh, Mormon story and I just remember thinking, man, I had none of these experiences growing up. I had none of these run-ins with, with patriarchy in the way that they did that to them was jarring and painful enough to wake them up to the fact that this is not okay. Right. And I just remember being really, really humbled by that. And it seemed similar to me to the issue of, I grew up in this church feeling like, um, feeling like God's love is conditional. Someone else, my sister is sitting next to me, not hearing any of those messages that I'm hearing. Right. It was kind of the same thing with women's issues and patriarchy. Like before that, everything that was said, every, every problematic thing went right by me. It was not sticking to my consciousness. I did not even see it. As soon as that paradigm got blown open, now I'm sitting in the pews and I'm hearing all of it and it's bugging me just as much, right? So it, it's just crazy how these paradigms can shift and can shift so rapidly. It's, it kind of gives you whiplash. Um, and the LGBT uh, issue was similar for me. I just, I, I was one back. I just, honestly, I hang my head. Like I, I was fine with prop eight when prop eight happened. I saw no problem with that. If I'd lived in California, I probably would have been helping out. Right. Um, at the same time, I was a very open person. I thought in my mind, like I had a problem. I thought it was sinful. I thought it was wrong, but I loved the people in my life who were LGBT. Um, I fought, I fought my parents to, to make sure that my, um, my gay cousin was able to bring his partner to my wedding. Like I, I, I fought for that because I knew that was not right to exclude him but I would certainly not be voting for his right to marry right at the time. So that's where I kind of was growing up. Um, and where I was just a few years before, 
But I remember feeling, being really in the depths of feeling very alone and marginalized in my own faith community and in my ward and having been someone who'd been a gospel doctrine teacher, being very good at it. I was always, I, I felt really respected um, at a certain point. Once I kind of got my feet under me with some of those callings, I really loved it and felt like I was respected. And then if, to have that taken away from me, I just remember sitting and, and it just hit me one day, like this kind of weight that I feel around people of not being okay, of being sinful in some way, of being a problem. This is how these people feel 24 seven and, and 5,000 times more like, and, and it just, opened up these, these doors of empathy for me that I'd never even considered what it would be like to be them before in my life. And it, it blew it open. So by the time the November, 2015 policy came around, I, it, it devastated me, just absolutely devastated me. Um, so anyway, that's kind of how I came to those things. So so we're we're November 2015 now. Mm. Like one thing that's remarkable mm. is that you know you haven't bailed, haven't bailed. from the church. Yeah. Uh, that you're trying to stay in it, and I get that. Yeah. Because I, Margie and I stayed in long after we lost faith, but it was really hard. It, yeah. A lot of cognitive dissonance, a lot of discomfort. Yeah. And that's fine. Anyone can do that for a month or six months or a year, but yeah. to try and do that for multiple yeah. years, mm -mm. it really starts to wear on you. For sure. And you start to feel like, man, is this really worth it? Is the distress mm -hmm. really worth it? And so then yeah. the social issues start piling on and you start becoming more socially conscious. Yes. It, that can really that can really take its toll. It, it did. All of that started taking its toll. And, and to your question, I kind of got off on a tangent there, but to your question of what could the church do? What, what did the church, what did my particular circumstances do right that helped me continue to stay in at that time? Um, I would say that the church itself, there were a few good people along the way that really helped, but actually more than anything, it hurt more than helped me during that time. To be honest, it was, I just want to, give credit where credit is due. It was Mormon stories. It was Dan Weatherspoon, Mormon Matters. It was Natasha. It was talking to a Maxine Hanks. It was ta taking in a lot of the the stuff that Tom, Thomas McConkey does through Lower Lights. It was all of that that gave me a place to feel like I was okay. It helped me build confidence in my own spiritual journey and helped me be able to emotionally differentiate myself from the church. And that sounds really crazy because the thing that we want to do in the church when someone has a faith crisis is pull them further in, make them more mainstream, tell them to read their scriptures more, tell them to pray more. And from my experience, anyone who tried to do that to me, it was soul killing. And if that is all I had had, I would not have lasted. I am fairly certain I would not have been able to take it and it w I would have just walked away. I had to have some people who were making space for me to be able to find my own path. Interesting. Yeah. I had to have someone say, there are problems with the book of Abraham and let's actually talk about that. I had to have that. If I hadn't had that, I just, it, the cognitive dissonance is too much when you start to see it yourself. You have to have people who are willing to talk about the issues. For me, the way was through, not to avoid and don't talk about those things and let's just focus on your testimony. And it, it just, it would, it would not fly for me. So it's one of the things that I've been advocating for to no avail in my local congregation, in my local board, in my, in my stake is I think it is so important to give people a place to grow spiritually within our umbrella. You've got to be willing to have a class, a fireside, a place within the church where you can actually have these discussions and let it get uncomfortable. 
And I, I think we need to protect the people for whom that is not their path. That is not, they want to just go to, go to church and do the ritual and feel good about it and feel, you know, build their testimony that way. We need to have a place for that too. We don't all have to do it the same way, but you are going to lose more and more and more and more people. I can't tell you how many people I have met who have left the church who have said, if I had had something like that, I wouldn't have left. Like if, like where a Sunday school class where I could actually talk about this stuff. If I knew that it was okay for me to ask the question, if I knew that I it's could like a release valve, it is it's like, let's the pressure off. Yes. Yeah. You cannot continue to make people feel like heretics and think that they are going to want to stay with you. Yeah. You can't do that to people. Mm. You've got to have a place for them to have their genuine experience, but it's super threatening. Culturally, we don't know how to do this. We don't have a framework for it. That is not the way we talk about faith. So, so we're going to jump out of story just for a second because I, mm -hmm. so we're gonna have a conversation right now and mm -hmm. then we'll get back to the story, but mm -hmm. forgive me. Sometimes listeners are like, stop interrupting the story, but sometimes <laughs> I just want to have a conversation. <laughs> so we're going to have a quick conversation. Yeah. So there's a guy on the internet just the past couple of days who's like, Oh, somebody, you know, I wrote a letter to Russell M. Nelson because I have a trans kid and, and no one in my ward or stake is treating my trans kid, right. My transgender kid. And I, I wrote the prophet and how do I get this letter to the prophet? Because if I could just write the prophet, you know, he'll understand and he'll do something about it. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking about that. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking about my response to him was like, like how long, like, how long are you still faithful? Like, and, and you're, you're kind of shaking your head and touching your heart. Why? I just want to make I sure. I just feel for that man. Why? Like, uh, okay. The journey just does this to people, right? <laughs> like something cracks your heart open to some person who is hurting, some person who is not doing it the way that we're supposed to be doing it. Um, you know, you have a kid who comes out as trans or gay or whatever. Someone, you know, you, you have a crisis of faith. You have, um, you know, you're a single woman who's never been married, whatever it is. So the person that's, that just feels like they're on the outs, right? And we are just such well-meaning people. We are such well-meaning people and we just think, if we can just let people know we're going to embrace these people, we're going to, we're going to find a way to embrace these people who are down, who, who, who need our love. We, we profess that we love LGBT people. Like we've got, there's gotta be a way if we can just let them know, if we can just let the leader know, if we can just give them the vision, right. That, that that's what we need to do. All will be well. And I, I just oh, clutch my heart because I know the crushing blow that is coming in the disappointment of how little we can actually do to try to change these things from the top down. It's, yeah. it's soul crushing. Yeah. And I, you know, and I'm not, you know, so like I was trying to be delicate because I mm -hmm. believe it or not, I'm not out to like crush anyone's faith. I'm not For out sure. to even get people to leave the church. I'm right. literally not. My people yeah. don't believe me. I'm literally I not. believe you. So you oh, thank you. I do. I yeah. believe you. So so I'm trying to like feel out where they are mm -hmm. because he's like, if I could just get this letter to the prophet, he'll make it all right. And I'm like, oh. oh so so I'm kind of feeling out where he is and 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 he, I'm like, well, do you still believe? And he's like, ah, oh, not really. But I, you know, mm -hmm. I, this is a passionate issue and I'm just trying to make a difference. And, and he's like, what do you think? You know, do you think if I get the letter to the prophet, it'll make a difference or, you know, and I'm just like, it's not that they don't care. I think Russell Nelson cares about everybody. I think he loves everybody. Agreed. And, and it's not that the general authorities don't care. Boyd K. Packer, he's passed away, but like mm -hmm. pick Holland or Bednar, what they care. They, they care, care about LGBT people. They do. They care. Yes. So it's not that. Um, but but if I if I'm like answering honestly, it's like I, if I'm them, my number one concern is protecting the the church. And when I say the church, mm -hmm. I mean its name, the assets 
legal liability, just just because if the church isn't strong, mm -hmm. everything else falls apart. Mm -hmm. So you have to protect the church. I'm like, that's their first gig is protecting the church. And then their second gig, and, I, and I'm, I'm getting this, I have the voice in my head of Jesus as I'm saying this, their second gig is protecting the 99. Mm -hmm. They got to protect the 99 because if you go after, and I'm, Jesus is laughing at me as I'm saying this, if you go after the one, you lose the 99 and you don't want to lose the 99. So, so the one is expendable. Yeah. Because you got to protect the assets, the name of the church, legal stuff, the the finances, or you've got no church. Mm -hmm. And then you got to protect the bulk of the membership because that's your main steward. The one, the one is like way down the list. Yeah. And so the, it's not that they don't care; they do. It's not that they're mm -hmm. bad people; they're not. Mm -hmm. But, but they can't worry that you're not. This is. Gays, feminist, intellectuals are just not the priority. They just can't be, and they never will be. Yeah. And as soon as the church starts changing the rules for trans kids and changing the rules for gay and lesbian kids and changing the church for intellectuals and mm -hmm. creating a Sunday school that's mm -hmm. alternative and talking openly about the essays and the problems mm -hmm. and saying, have your gay... Word, you know, have you have your gay and lesbian and transgender law of chastity, mm -hmm. you know, it, it all falls apart. So ironically, historically, in the past 10, 15, 20 years, it's been left to Sunstone and Mormon mm -hmm. stories and a thoughtful faith, the Mormon matters, and mm -hmm. all these uncorrelated, unofficial mm -hmm. Thomas McConkie, did I already say that? Like mm -hmm. it's 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 we have been kind of like it's not like the church has been paying us, mm -hmm. but we've been cleaning up the church's messes. Mm -hmm. Not be, you know, again, not because they don't care, just because, you know, we feel called to it or we find a way to scratch out a living or whatever. But like, that's what we've been doing. We've been cleaning up those Natasha and Dan Witherspoon and you yeah. now, and because the church can't do it. So there's this mm -hmm. whole like little alternative community of people trying to write books, mm -hmm. trying to hold these little schleppy workshops and mm -hmm. retreats, mm -hmm. doing Sunstone, scratching out a podcast, mm -hmm. just seeing if we can make a difference because yeah. there's all this collateral damage. Yes. And the church can't, the church just can't. Yeah. And, and then there was this time Starting in November 2015, mm -hmm. my ex Kate's communi excommunication, my excommunication, Jeremy mm -hmm. Runnell's excommunication, mm -hmm. all the excommunications, mm -hmm. and then the November policy, and then the reversal of the policy. Yes. And then all of a sudden, it's just, it was like there was some like, like the superhero, like, like snap from like the Avengers movie with Thanos, where it was just like, <laughs> boosh, mm -hmm. and like, it was just like, it was like a nuclear bomb exploded. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, all of a sudden, like so much of that just like disappeared. Or Dane Women's kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. Dan Witherspoon's kind of gone off the map. Mm -hmm. Gina's still there with a thoughtful faith. Mm -hmm. But but like, you know, I had to regroup. And, mm -hmm. it, and just so many progressive and post-Mormons were just like, we're out of here. Mm. We're done. Mm. Like this middle ground, like we can't sustain it anymore. Mm. And I'm not saying that it's all dead because yeah, there's always a spring not. after the winter. Yep. And I, and Dan's still there. I'm not even yeah, saying Dan's absolutely. gone, but something happened by the November, 2015, by the, by two, 2015, but then the policy reversal mm where things just shifted. And I don't even know mm. quite how to describe it. All I can say is mm. a lot of us were carrying a lot of water, cleaning up a lot of collateral damage mm. for a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden something nuclear happened. And now we're in this period, well, COVID, you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And now we're in this period of like, where, where are things? Like my yeah. head is spinning. Yeah. You know, um, what are your reflections as you hear me kind of talk about all that? Because i that's not yeah. really a question. It's more of a conversation. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just expressing what I just, you know. Yeah. So this is what I would say is, yes, the people on the, the fringes, all the people you've mentioned, 
um, have the freedom to do things in a way that the church probably doesn't have, you know, to, to really go after the one in different ways and from a different paradigm. Um, the way I see the leadership of the church, I agree with you. I think they care. They care deeply. And I think they are looking for, at the world through a paradigm that I no longer share completely, but I can have empathy for. So I think to them, the way that you care for LGBT people is to keep them faithful. That's, that is their paradigm. The way that we care for people is to bring them into doing things the right way. And we know the right way and let us help you get to that right way. Cause this is what brings happiness. And from their life experience, from their spiritual intuition, from their life, from everything that has happened to them, they, how would they know any different? That, that is the way to happiness for them. That is it. That is the way you obey, you do the things and that brings happiness. So I kind of look at them and say, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know them. I don't pr profess to know them. But I think even more than we've got to protect the assets of the church, I think they really think this is the way you minister. I think they really think this is the way you minister. I think more on the ground, I've seen that like, oh, we can't, we've got to protect the 99. I've felt that a lot. I've had that conversation with my church leaders. I, I've told them, I feel like you're more concerned about the 99 than the one just throwing that out there. Like I would really like to find new ways because I'm there on the margins, having the conversations that they're not having with you. And so at some point you've got to start listening to people on the margins. And I think there's a big disconnect with that because, and I would imagine if someone had given me callings early on in my life that gave me more and more and more leadership and more and more and more responsibility. And at some point, my spiritual intuitions, everyone around me and myself, and like, this is what God wants for all people. That's really hard. That's a really hard place to get into the brain of a marginalized person when that is your experience. And I think it is just a truth of human nature that when you are in the core of any group, and you're in the core because that group, what their norms work for you. You are, you are, you have a deficit in really understanding the problems in the system. Because any problem that comes to your attention, it's easy to brush away and say, well, you just need to be more. I mean, look at me. It works. I did it. Look at all these people who are doing it. We're, this, it's not the system. The system is great. The system is ordained from God. This is the system. So it's, it's hard. I think it is an uphill climb for people in leadership to really get their brains around what ministering looks like for these people. I think it's really, really hard. I don't know what the solution is for that, <laughs> but I feel like it, we, we would be much, a much better people. Any institution is going to be better the more you have a feedback loop from the marginalized, because that's where the wisdom comes of what needs to happen. But we don't give enough, we don't give enough weight to those people. Those people are threatening to the system. Those people are threatening to the way we do things. And it's a really big move for someone to believe that and do something about it and say, we need to do things differently. And I'm not even saying how we should do it. Like I'm, I can honor that they are the leadership of the church this is their, their role, their job to make the rules. This is, that's what they've been ordained to do. And it's problematic. Yeah. I think what I was, I think if I had to summarize what I'm trying to express is yeah. there were many of us that were fighting really hard to kind of create, to carve out and to nurture a middle way. Yeah. And that was genuinely my intention from the very beginning, yeah. from 2005, yeah. from the beginning of Mormon Stories. Yeah. And it felt like the church's response to that is, we are going to pulverize mm -hmm. this effort. Agreed. And, and so it now, so it was there for you, it was there yeah. for tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. 
But at some point, it got pulverized. I even hung on for a couple of years after my excommunication. Mm -hmm. But at some point, um, it kind of got pulverized, yeah. and it became. It, it's got. It seems like it's kind of gotten to the point where now those support systems aren't in place. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, they're at least the ones that were there have been kind of pulverized. Mm -hmm. I know there are new ones emerging. We'll talk about that. Yeah. But now it just seems like people are in the church until they start having a crisis of faith mm -hmm. and then they just leave. Mm -hmm. It seems like more of that is going on right now mm. than, than maybe was going on five or five or eight years ago, mm. because I think it, the church found that to be really problematic on the one hand, they didn't have any solutions, but on the other hand, they were uncomfortable with our solutions. Mm -hmm. And so instead they just kind of decided to kind of pulverize it all. Mm -hmm. And, and now we're left in this space where the middle way, mm -hmm. um, where it's not clear where to go or who to go to, mm -hmm. to try and carve out a middle way. Mm -hmm. And I guess the exception to that is Patrick Mason's got his book mm -hmm. and that's just coming out mm -hmm. now. Uh, restoration, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, Terrell and Fiona have just come out with with their new book that we yeah. that we reviewed. The Turnbulls are doing some stuff yeah. with Faith Matters. Faith is, Matters, uh, absolutely. And I guess I guess it was right for them for that to kind of be wrestled away from me. I'm an apostate. I got excommunicated. Open Stories Foundation kind of isn't really the place for that to be happening anyway. Maybe some would say, mm -hmm. and so. And then the Maxwell Institute is now trying to um, start start exploring these types of new ways. So mm -hmm. in some sense, mm -hmm. it feels like there's this new renaissance of middle way Mormonism mm -hmm. that's actually starting to emerge a lot closer into the center of the church. Mm. Um, the essays have come out now. They're trying to incorporate the problematic history into the CES and the curriculum. So in some sense, it's kind of like the church said, no, we're going to destroy what you were trying to do, but we're going to try and rebuild it hmm. from within or from closer within. Hmm. And so I don't mean to make it sound so stark. Yeah. There is this new spring of progressive Mormonism happening. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to explore that with you in, mm -hmm. in the next segment. Yeah. But like to close this segment. Yeah. Um, as we kind of, what I want to do is I want to shift to away from kind of your journey. Yeah. To kind of what you've learned from Richard Rohr mm -hmm. and what what uh, you you called it. Um, Contemplative Mormonism. Yeah. I want to get into in, in mm. kind of the next segment mm. what that means to you mm -hmm. because I think it's interesting and worth exploring. Yeah. How do you want to end kind of this mm. segment as we kind of reflect on what we've all been through yeah. and your journey? Because yeah. this is kind of the closeout to your journey Yeah. in terms of just a, a chronological story yeah. before we dive into some content. And what, what, what do you want to end with? this segment on in terms of reflections or close out your story. Yeah. So this is, I, I'll, I'll say this and then I'll close out my story, but I think um, just reflecting on what you're saying, I think that this is, this is a, a period of growing pains. And I think the church has always been in growing pains. The church has always moved. It's going to people develop institutions, develop, the restoration is ongoing. Um, I, I, it, it, it is, it, we're always going to be in some sort of a mess. My guess is anytime you lived in Mormonism, it's going to feel like so, somewhat of a mess. <laughs> yeah. It's part yeah. of what I when love about it. When it not a mess? Right. When yeah. has it not been a mess? We've just had different messes <laughs> yeah, at different times. That's life too, right? Right? Yeah. So, um, but what I would say is it is difficult for any person or institution when someone pops up, no matter how true, no matter how, how good the merits, it is hard for all of us if some, when the thing that we are identified with and the thing that we believe is like true and the thing, when someone pops up and says something, wait a minute, something's not working here. 
it is hard for any of us to do that kind of shadow work that we need to do to allow in that, whoa, this might be true. There might be a problem we need to look at. That's hard. It's hard to be a human. It's more part of second life, half of life spirituality, truly, to start excavating our shadows and what we can be doing better than it is first half of life, just do the right things. I don't know that our institution is at a point where it can handle that. So when you pop up, when Kate Kelly pops up, when Sam Young pops up, when people pop up that are, that are showing and, and say, yeah, Bill real. All, when, when, when people are showing up and saying, there's a problem here. It seems like there is an evolution of people just really wanting, like, if I could just talk to the prophet, I know that he's loving, we'll just fix this thing. Right. And, and then when there are, there are walls to that and there are problems with that, it turns to, no, you don't understand that this really needs to change. And I just want to honor the pain that people like you, that now I'm aware of that so many people in this space, the pain that we see that people are willing to share with us, that they are not willing to share with the the leadership of the church um, informs us in different ways. We're having a different experience than they're having. And so I just, I have to leave room for anyone in their own lives and in their own callings and in their own roles, the dignity of life has brought them to where they are. And I believe that most of us are loving people trying to do it the very best way we can. But it's, it's threatening. It's threatening when someone shows us our shadow. And so we're going to obliterate it, at least from us. Now you go do what you want to do on your own, right? I mean, no one has come through and told you not to do. I mean, they've tried to tell you not to do Mormon stories, but once you're not part of them, they don't have that power, right? So People on the margins are still doing their thing. They're still going to do their thing. They're still going to bring awareness, I hope, to these things because it's an important voice. It's an important thing for us to raise the flag of saying something is not right here. All is not well in Zion. We need to, we need to actually include this. We will be better Christ-like people if we do. We will become more of the body of Christ if we do. And we're not there. We're not there to be able to take that in yet. Institutionally, we don't have what it takes. So loving, loving people, doing things the best they know how to do and doing things right, it is hurting people unintentionally and seemingly a lot of people are just unaware of the carnage. Completely unaware. I know I was. 100% unaware. So let me let me maybe close by asking you this two part question. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned Bill Real being kind of that uh, that voice mm. in the darkness that made you feel like you weren't alone. Yes. You mentioned ordained women and and you becoming aware of patriarchy and yeah. feminism. You yep. mentioned LGBT issues yep. and you mentioned the November policy and the reversal. You mentioned Sam Young. You yep. mentioned me. Yep. What what was it like to see all of that get just rejected yeah. and to see all those people get excommunicated by yeah. the church when those people were such a critical part of mm-hmm. helping you when you needed help and of even keeping you in the church? Yeah. So that's part one of the question. Okay. And then part two of the question is what made you decide to get in the ring? Mm, yeah. Okay. So question one, um, it's an emotional roller coaster. I, I hate it. I hate it when I see us cutting people off. I hate it when the things that we see as a threat um, doesn't have to be a threat. I, I, I hate, I understand it. I see it. I, I get where people are coming from. I can see why. I mean, I thought it was threatening at one point. Like I can't not look at that and say, but I, but, um, I don't know. I, I see it as a tragedy unfolding in front of me is the best way I can, I can, uh, explain it because being harassed right now. Yeah. I mean, I, 
people I love, people I know the goodness of who they are. I've had the opportunity to get to know you, John. I've had the opportunity to get to know Natasha. I've had the opportunity to get to know Bill Real a little bit. I've had an opportunity to get to know some of these people. And I know the goodness of all of your hearts. I see it. I feel it. I know the sincerity. And it, it it's going to bring me to tears. Like, I... I, I know I knew Sam Young before he started his whole thing, you know. I know the goodness of all of this, these people. And it breaks my heart that we cannot find a way to include everybody because there are important things that are being brought up that we would be better if we paid attention to, but we don't know how to handle it. And, I, and it makes me really, really sad. Really sad. It's a missed opportunity, and it's and it's just not right. And the it's, pain that's in, I just have to say it's mm-hmm. it's more than just mm-hmm. and just take me out of it. Mm-hmm. It's more than just we don't have room for these people. Yeah. It's like these people are yeah. actually helping the church improve and get better. Hundred percent. And we're going to punish them for that. 100%. That's the weird. That's the weird thing. A hundred percent. Because is it it's, safer for children to be interviewed now? Yes. Thank yeah. you, Sam Young. Yep. Is the church better with women yep. now? Yes. Thank you, Kate Kelly. Yep. Is the church more honest in its history? Yep. Yes. Thank you, Bill Real. Thank yep. you, RFM. Thank you, John Dolan. Thank mm-hmm. you. You know. Yeah. Sunstone, right? Agreed. Uh, like all the positive. Is is the church better with LGBTQ people? Okay. Yes. You know. Thank you, all the people that contributed mm-hmm. to that. Mm-hmm. Somewhat better. I don't know. A little yeah. bit better. Yeah. A it's definitely better. a little bit better. A little bit better, for sure. And and it's like, um, you know, it's like for all the people that have helped make the church mm-hmm. start to see its weaknesses and yeah. do better, yeah. the church's response is, yep. okay, yeah, we'll make some positive changes and we'll destroy everyone who was a part of it, telling us that we needed to change and do better. It's an absolute catch-22 because I doubt that any of them want to actually – give you credit for any of those things. I'm not even right? giving her credit. I, no, I, I know, but, or give that. anyone credit yeah. for any of those things. Right. I don't, I don't know that. I don't know. It would be an interesting conversation to see if the leadership of the church actually feels like you guys were instrumental in bringing maybe any of those we things about. Maybe we weren't. I mean, it kind of seems like you were, but I don't know if they consciously would see that. What I think that they see is this is a person who is threatening to something that we hold sacred this is threatening to people's faith. The way that they're seeing the world, letting you speak is taking people away from the church. They don't understand the people like me that it's keeping in the church. That does not even compute to them. I don't. I really, honestly, don't think they even understand how that could be a thing. I remember having a conversation in in one of our ward councils, and they were talking about if you're having a faith crisis, don't Google. Don't go to Google. And I raised my hand and I said, I would not be sitting here if I didn't Google. I would not be still in the building if I didn't. I would be nowhere near here. We people need to be able to follow their curiosities and understand and questions. You need to be able to do that, but we don't have a framework that understands that, that piece of a faith journey. They don't understand that. That looks as like a problem to be fixed and to bring you back. Something they, broken. They, yes, yeah. they don't understand that as a developmental step into to a deeper kind of a faith. They see that as a falling off into the abyss where, you know, the last time in someone's development, they saw people making choices against the church. People were making really bad decisions for their life and making life really, really, really hard for themselves through sin. Right. If you hold, let go of the iron rod, the narrative is that's where that's right where you're going to end up if you do that. Right. So they're trying to keep people from doing that. So someone who is saying we're doing this all wrong. I honestly don't think we have the framework to understand how that can help the system. We only see how that can hurt the system. It feels threatening. It feels threatening to our identities. It feels threatening to the way we're doing things. It feels threatening to the system, to the plan of salvation, to the place we're supposed to go, to our obedience. And we don't know how to hold it. And so we've got to cut it off before it becomes a problem. So it is, it's bringing awareness. You guys are all bringing awareness and you're too threatening to include in the process. But I don't feel like most of you start out that way either. Like someone says, hey, hey, there's a problem. When no one listens, you've got to start making some noise, you know? 
I don't know. His joke is, as Bill Real is, John Delin once was, and as John <laughs> Delin is, Bill Real may become. And, and it's not about me or Bill. No, I the totally remember is, is this. How many times does somebody stand up and go back to the September 6th, <laughs> yeah. go back to Lowell Benyon, go back to Leonard totally. Arrington, go yeah. back to Eugene England, like, yeah. and women too, right? Mm -hmm. Juanita Brooks or, mm -hmm. you know, whoever, mm -hmm. uh, Maxine Hanks. Mm -hmm. You know, you, mm -hmm. you start out seeing a problem, loving the mm -hmm. church, wanting to help it. Totally. And then you try and help, and then you there's an evolution to it, sacrificed, right? Sacrificed, you know, absolutely. And then hopefully 100%. the church will change, and it's just the way it works. So okay, so yeah. given all that, yeah, why in the world would you want to <laughs> jump into the fray, yeah, and uh, and try and put yourself on that uh, on those. Train tracks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right? Such a good question. Or are you? I mean, you yeah, kind of are. I kind of, I think I kind of am. Um, you know, I kind of had a confluence that came together there when I actually was accepted to the living school, which I found out was not an easy thing. I don't know how I slipped through. I, It has a very low acceptance rate. But at the, at the same time, I... Um, I started getting more involved in lower lights. I had the living school on the horizon was accepted to that. And at the same time, that was exactly the same time four years ago when Natasha started symmetry solutions and invited me to be um, a coach for, um, for symmetry and work in this area. And I had always at the back of my mind, I'd actually talked to some graduate programs about going back and, and becoming a therapist um, I think I had some, have some natural abilities toward that. And so I remember talking to Natasha saying, you know, I'm kind of thinking about being a therapist. I have also heard there's this thing about coaching. I don't know much about it. Do you have any thoughts on that? What would be necessary for doing this kind of work? And um, she gave me this opportunity to just try it out with coaching. And so I jumped on and I got a, a, my schooling with coaching and, and started working with her and, um, so it's, it's almost not been this big conscious decision. It's almost just been following the opportunities that have come my way and following my heart of what feels right, taking the opportunities that feel like this is what I need to be doing and having this huge break open in my heart uh, toward the marginalized and to being able to see so many of the things that I feel like we have opportunities to do better. Um, that has made me want to help in any possible way that I can, because when I see what worked for has been working for me, I want to offer that to other people. You know, I, I don't want people who would be well served staying with a church congregation not even know that there is a possible way to do it and just leave because they don't know the possibilities. I am great with people that that is not their path. I am great with that. And I, but I, I, I hate seeing it happen when people don't know that there might've been a way to do it. I, I just want people to know their options. So I've, I've had this big desire to, help people at least understand what I know to see if it's a fit for them. You know, if their heart is telling them they, they have, there's some part of them that doesn't want to let it go. And so if you had to state kind of your goal or your mm -hmm. mission in this regard, it yeah. would be to what? So my, my deepest, biggest wish is to allow people to have um, their own genuine journey through this life in their relationship with faith and not be hamstrung by the narrow definitions that they've been grown, that they have grown up with. Um, I, I'm reading probably the best book on faith crisis I've ever read right now called faith after doubt by Brian McLaren. There was a, I I'm just a few chapters in, but there was a quote that he quoted some philosopher, um, and it said, I feel like I'm paraphrasing. My goal in life is to bring faith to the faithless and doubt to the faithful. <laughs> <laughs> and when I read that, I really resonated with it because there's, that's kind of a little bit where I am because I see this possibility of a, 
of a deeper way to do it for those who want it. And I don't think we've made room for that. And I want to do all I can to allow people that space to find that because I, I'm really sad when someone leaves the church only because there was no room for them to continue down a spiritual path. I, I'm a big believer in that spirituality in and of itself is a really important thing to, our, to all of our, our, the quality of our lives, in, up to and including atheists. I think atheists can have very rich spiritual lives. But we've conflated it so completely with belief and religiosity and everything that we don't let it flourish. We don't let religiosity be what it needs to be, which is the support to that real living human inner journey that we're all here to have. So um, so for me, that's kind of the preview because yeah. now what we're going to do is we're going to end this segment because it's kind of Jana's story that's kind of led her to this work that she wants to do. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I, yeah. I loved it. Thank for you. me, it was super heartfelt and fascinating and inspiring. So thank you for sharing that and for giving us yeah. that part of your story. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And don't go away. What we'll do is we'll end this episode and then we'll take a bathroom break and then we'll come <laughs> right back. And we're going to have a discussion where... I basically ask you a lot of questions around why would people even want to bother? Why is the church worthy? The LDS church worthy is a place to pursue spirituality given its problematic history mm -hmm. and its problematic behavior and all the problems with it. Mm -hmm. Why, why is it even worthy? And if somebody even wants to entertain this possibility, what might be, some ways to start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And of course that's a, that's a multi-year multi-decade conversation, but we'll start that conversation mm -hmm. just to give people a sense for the beginnings of the path. Okay. How does that sound? Sounds great. All right. All right. All right, Jana. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this part of my interview with Jana Spengler. Jana, it's been great to have you mm -hmm. and we'll see you in just a few minutes for my next part with Jana, which is, I'm going to call it, <laughs> contemplative Mormonism, uh, mm -hmm. exploring the path of contemplative Mormonism with Jana Spengler. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jana. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>